Okay. Looks like it's Mikey here. There he is. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of June 13th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Councilmember Urain? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Crisanti? Here. We have a quorum. Do we have any public speakers on the closed session items? Yes, you have five speakers signed up. They are Mark Martin, Joe Drummond, Rosemary Ide, Colin Drummond, and Howard Redsky. I see Howard Redsky in the meeting, so we'll hear from him first. Very good. Howard, are you available to speak to us? I am available to speak to you. Hello? Please do so. Okay. Regarding the legal action by a Malibu citizen, um, you need to hire Best Best and Krieger or another firm that is a very skilled defense attorney that understands how to make the complaint and prove their case and make them do so, do the work, depositions, paperwork, starting immediately. A number of years ago, the city was inundated by lawsuits. The city council then tried to go about dealing with the complainants nicely. Um, this didn't work out very well because we just got many, many more complainants because the city was a piggy bank. When Christie got very tough, the lawsuit stopped. Okay. This type of thing, especially by one of our own citizens, takes away from city resources that are precious dollars for <clears throat> Wolsey fire victims, public safety, schools, etc. Please take very aggressive and stern stand immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rudsky. Do we have anyone else to speak to us? I am checking to confirm, Mayor, but I still don't see Mark Martin, Joe Drummond, Rosemary Ide, or Colin Drummond in the meeting, and I don't have any raised hands either. So that concludes public comment on the closed session. Okay. We will now recess to the closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 6.30 to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. So we will see you at the closed session. Thank you.
Hi, Steve. Hi, Key. Paul, well, maybe we should start, and I assume Karen will be here. Okay. Uh, it's now uh, 6.32. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of June the 13th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I've lost my video. Oh, there I am again. Uh, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Councilmember Uri? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. Do you have a quorum? Will you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag. flag. Of, of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the, the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. May I have a closed session report? Yes, Mayor Grisanti, members of the council, good uh, evening at this point. Uh, good evening. There were two items on the closed session agenda tonight. Uh, one was anticipated litigation and involving a claim from Joe Drummond against the city of Malibu dated January 24th, 2022. The council voted by a vote of five to zero to reject that claim and directed me to send correspondence along those lines. The second involved a conference with legal counsel for a workers' compensation claim. The council received enough data on that uh, claim and gave direction with regard to certain negotiations towards it, but took no reportable actions. Other than that, uh, the council took no other reportable actions, and that would conclude my report. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. 
I'll second, second it. it. Okay, we have a first and a second to approve the agenda. Can we have a roll call vote, Kelsey? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on June 3rd, 2022, with the amended agenda posted on June 10th, 2022. Okay. That brings us to item 1A, which is a ceremonial presentation, a presentation of con com commendation to Sherry Latta. And I have a copy of the commendation right here. And I don't know, because of the, nobody can see it, because of the wonderful blue, blue screen. Uh, I understand Sherry is in the meeting. So I'm going to read this. Whereas longtime resident of Malibu, Sherry Latta, found her passion for teaching at just age seven and went on to study teaching, eventually re receiving credentials in teaching and directing. And whereas in 1982, Sherry founded Children's Creative Workshop, where children are inspired to learn academics in an artistic and innovative atmosphere. And whereas the curriculum at Children's Creative Workshop focused on creatively teaching children about Malibu's most unique characteristics, such as marine life, Chumash history, local wildlife, ecology, geology, and more. And whereas Sherry Latta went above and beyond during the COVID-19 pandemic school closures by sending home weekly structured education packets for the children. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the City Council of the City of Malibu com commends Sherry Latta for her 40-year contribution to the youth of the City of Malibu, guiding and inspiring them to never stop learning in a fun and creative way. Sherry, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Um, I'm really humbled um, by your commendation, and I thank you very much. Uh, it is my passion. It's what I do, so it, it wasn't a hardship for me. Um, it's been a hardship uh, facing the closure, um, but I feel really good about the 40 years that I've had, and I'm sorry, I'm emotional. I'll take a breath. Um, I just want to thank you, and I, I do feel appreciated, and again, I'm so grateful for what I've had and the children that I've taught and the families I've gotten to know, and I will continue on in one way or another, and thank you very, very much. Thank you, Sherry. <sighs> I believe that takes us to written and oral communications from the public. Do we have any communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the City Council has subject matter jurisdiction? City Council may not act on these matters except to refer the matters to staff or schedule the matters for a future agenda. Do we have any public speakers? Yes, you have 16 speakers for this item. The first few are Bill Sampson, Evan Contino, and Brian Klein. We'll hear from Bill Sampson first. Hi, Bill, are you available? Uh, could I be heard after Joe Drummond? I'm gonna reflect upon her remarks, if that's possible. Sometime after, I don't care exactly when. All right. Thank you. Who do we have next? Next, we have Evan Contino. Evan, are you available? I am, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. I work with Burge Architects and uh, we've done about 40 plus fire rebuild uh, applications, mainly working with uh, the original homeowners. And um, I know that's a small piece of the, of the puzzle, the, uh, the rebuilds that have been processed, but it came to my attention that there's been some discussion about option four between a member of the public and the Coastal Commission, Richard Mollica, Planning Department, City Council, and the uh, Planning Commission. And uh, a couple of things that I wanted to say about that. I don't believe that the Coastal Commission should adopt 
their interpretation of an existing home based on its existence physically. Um, and I, that, that was the key thing in the, uh, in the correspondences that, that I read. Um, the planning department's interpretation from what I've understood and has been not only uh, adapted to the, to the fire rebuilds, but across all projects is that what is existing is, is considered legally existing. And if that is, there are construction permits that have been finaled, if there are coastal records, assessor records, and all of these uh, records will deem uh, a, a legally existing structure. The fire took, the Woolsey fire took out a lot of legally existing structures. And to say that it's not existing because it physically isn't there, it was a final permit. And it, it was, and the, the property should be legally vested in that. Uh, final permit. Um, this also applies to non-fire rebuilds, um, where if you a have an approved application and you're in construction, it's not you're not vested in that uh, improvement until the permit is final. And the the second thing I wanted to touch on is my understanding also is that fire rebuilds aren't getting two coastal exemptions. You have the option of either to rebuild in kind plus 10% on a PV application, uh, which if you're the original owner, you could have your fees waived for a period of time and you would go through an expedited process. Or you could opt to uh, process your application administratively where you would get to rebuild what was legally existing plus up to 50%, depending on the lot constraints, of course, along with other items, possibly a basement, a pool, retaining walls, remedial grading, et cetera. Um, so those are the two points that I wanted to make that I just don't think are will be consistent across the board for not only all fire rebuilds of different kinds, different owners, different lot sizes, but also for um, non-fire rebuild properties. Thank you, Evan. Who's Our next? next speaker, we have Brian Klein, followed by Dustin Callagy, Julie Martin, and Ariel Greenis. Brian, are you available? I am. How is everybody? Good. Thanks for letting me speak. My wife and I bought a burnt out lot on Blue Water about three years ago. And we've been working with the city to figure out the path of how to rebuild the house and also make it so it's something that we um, can live in with our, our growing family. Um, so we've, about a year or so ago, sat down with the city. They were great. They came up with a plan for the PV plus 10% uh, submittal, which we recently got our stamp for. And then we were about to um, submit our APR plans for submittal and heard that there is some sort of a roadblock by someone named uh, Joe Drummond um, and she's trying to obstruct these APRs from going through, which completely confuses and baffles us. We've uh, done everything that the city asked us to do. We've put a lot of time, money, and energy into this, and so is the city. We've we've talked to them many times, and there's been a lot of hours put into this. And, you know, it's not like we just um, are, are developers and coming in and trying to make this work. We've been living in the community for the last 13 to 15 years between the two of us we rent a place on uh on heather cliff so we pay rent there we pay the mortgage at the land and all we want to do is build this house my wife had a baby about two years ago we have another one on the way we are the people that you want in this community we are the people that you want to uh, uh, have kids go to school there um if we can't do this we're going to end up selling it to the highest bidder and who is that i have no idea but what are you guys doing allowing this one person and her minions to come in and obstruct this? It's ridiculous. We're very close. People want to get back into their homes. They want to get back into their lives. And there's already a bottleneck um, getting people to do that since the fire. It's ridiculous. It's been three and a half years. You've had over 500 houses burned and only 707, or, I'm sorry, 77 people have a certificate of occupancy. It's ridiculous. So all we we hope for is that this goes away and we can come in and build our home. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't see Dustin Colleghi in the meeting, so we'll try to circle back to them later. 
and see if we can unmute Julie Martin here. We have two Martins in the meeting, so you may have to bear with us for a moment. Looks like we may not have the right Martin at the moment, so we'll move on to Ariel Varinas and see if we can circle back to Julie Martin later as well. Ariel, Ariel are you available? You. Are you available, Ariel? Ariel, you are unmuted. Ariel may be having a microphone issue. She is unmuted in Zoom, but we okay. can try to come back to her later as well. And we can hear from Joe Drummond next. Hi, Joe, are you available? Hi, yes, I am. We hear you. Okay, Malibu City Council, as you now know, on May 25th, 2022, the Coastal Commission, California Coastal Commission's Code Enforcement Office notified the city to cease the city's practice of granting secondary exemptions for Woolsey Fire Rebuilds because doing so violates the adopted Malibu local implementation and our local coastal plan and thus the Coastal Act, which is determinative over Malibu's practice and interpretation for its mun municipal code. Two council members, one of which did hear and make decisions on five re rebuild codes, questioned these planned much larger homes that were previously there, why they weren't going to the planning commission for approval and the public receiving due notice. Though their questions were never answered. However, a council member who actually voted on those fire rebuild codes and knew the intention was not to create any loopholes to incentivize larger home rebuilds after the fire actually circumvented the codes that she signed off of in her own burnout purchase and rebuild of over 40% larger in size. I'd like Karen Ferrer to answer what she was thinking in trying to get away with going against codes she helped put in place for her own personal benefit. Why did you jump ahead of actual fire victims who were just trying to complete one-to-one -one builds? Your extra square footage was more than quadruple what the law allowed, 10%. After the 93 fire, several homes on Big Rock built one-to-one -one or less to simply modernize and meet their needs. The one that almost tripled somehow in size is still there, having burned down twice and remains an unfinished eyesore along Big Rock Drive for the past 25 years. Why didn't you just go through the proper CDP process, especially as your property purchased is on ESHA? I hope city planning will not continue to try and circumvent the codes to try and protect itself and certain council members from the repercussions from this non-compliance. A certificate of occupancy is required for the CDP exemption for addition, simple as that. This has been processed incorrectly as two exemptions. Our city is showing how far from transparent it is if we have to go to the Coastal Commission or our own hired attorneys to get the correct answers and actually have the codes properly applied. The planning department needs to learn the codes and follow them and make up and not make up their own rules to benefit developers and people who want to profit from the fire. I'd like an answer from Council and City Manager Steve McClary and John Cloudy. What response will be given for this abuse of power by Ms. Bearer and the cure and repair required for this? I hope the two city council members who have diligently been trying to follow up on this follow through on the penalties and possible revocation of permits and burnout lots purchased for overdevelopment. As I said in the last planning commission hearing, fire victims had nothing to do with encouraging this error and blatant disregard of the actual fire rebuild codes and should not be penalized in any way. We know this has been spearheaded by the former planning director, city manager, and developers who were looking for a loophole to take advantage of sad and a dire situation to say the least. I just watched the beginning of the fire rebuild workshop on March 29, 2019, which happened after the city council vote where you Richard discussed this option for and referenced talking to architects and developers who seem to have helped put this scheme together, not to the codes. Those developer projects, including Ms. Ferris, now need investigation and certificate of, of occupancies revoked. So and, that's your time. Okay, thanks. We'd appreciate some straightforward Thank you, Joe. tough answers on this terrible. Our next speaker would be Luca Ikovni, but I don't see them in the meeting quite yet. So we'll hear from Heather Alfano, followed by John Alfano and Doug Sandler. Hi, Heather, are you available? I am, can you guys hear me? We hear you. Okay, hi, so Heather Alfano, Malibu resident since 2015. I'm the mom to three kids, all in Malibu schools. We lost our home to the Woolsey Fire 
and we've been working tirelessly to rebuild and maintain some semblance of a normal normal life while doing so. Um, I think the city of Malibu has a duty to assist its residents in becoming whole again after a disaster, like an out of control fire. We have been piecing our life together with insurance claims, finding rentals in this area that fit within our displacement budget and keep our kids in their respective schools and waiting on the city to ramp back up to pre COVID levels of functioning for three and a half years. It makes zero sense for a fire rebuild to have to wait until it is complete to apply for permits on a basement pool retaining walls, upgrading fire access, safer landscaping, or even a home addition. Building a home on a fresh lot needs to be a succinct process, not a piecemeal mess. Why would we want to prevent people from conforming their fire access, upgrading their septic system, or becoming more energy efficient? We are in the midst of a housing crisis here in California. The rent is exorbitant. We are on a very strict timeline currently, our family personally to try to finish our home before our displacement money has been completely used up. It has been three and a half years since the fire with more than 500 homes burned. I believe only 82 have been rebuilt. That's embarrassing and a travesty. The rebuilding process has not been expedited or made easy by the city. Our family only received our final permits about six months ago, three years after we lost our home. I know of multiple high end projects that were able to get their permits in a much more ex expedient manner and they were not fire rebuilds, but they were paying full pop. So please ask yourself, are you holding true to keeping the fire victims at the top of the priority list? Please help us get back to our home and stop impeding this process. I just want my kids to be able to walk to the elementary school we live a block away from. That dream is already lost for my firstborn. I'm hopeful for the next two. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our Heather. next speaker is John Alfano, followed by Doug Sandler, Lloyd Ahern, Lloyd Ahern, and Howard Redsky. Hi, John, are you available? Mr. Yeah. Alfano, are you available? Can you guys hear me? Great. Um, so I'm not going to reemphasize what my wife just kind of went over. Um, I'm a business owner, and I understand how to get things done. And from my point of view, this has been a manpower thing since day one with the city and the planning department, staff up, please, and let's move this thing along. We're almost four years into this, 70 homes out of 600 or 800 that are done. Like, we're, we're failing drastically at this. And for new laws and new motions and let's pause this and let's get coastal in now, like, for a retaining wall. Like, I mean, it's just, the, these are things you have to do to build houses properly, right? These are the new code enforcements that need to go in. This is not an easy process. I'm in construction. I'm a low voltage contractor and I pull my hair out daily. I'm tired of the, I'm tired of the embarrassment that I have to face with family and friends when they say, how's the new house coming along? And for three years, I'm like, we're still in the city. I have friends that live in other cities other than Malibu and look at me like I'm crazy. Why hasn't this been done yet? How can this process take this long? What are they doing for you? Do they not understand that what's happened to you? The dream that my wife talked about, we live on Doom Drive, less than a block away from Point Doom Elementary. When the house burned down, my son was in first grade. He will be in fifth grade next year. This is his last year to be able to walk to school as a kid in America in 2022. And that dream will not be done because my house won't be done in time. It has not been a lack of effort or funds for my insurance company or contractors or architects or expediters. And I can't even name, embarrassed to talk about the amount of money I've paid in consultant fees to have this happen to know that hopefully we get an email back within six to 12 weeks from the planning department just to respond that they've seen something. In any other business in this world, you would be fired for inefficiency to be able to complete something in a normal, manageable time. And it's an embarrassment. I know you are a good city. I like what you guys have been doing, but it's time to get involved with the planning department and this commission to move this process forward and not go back to changing things and bringing coastal in for people that are already through this process. Thank you. Thank you, John. 
Our next speaker is Doug Sandler, followed by Lloyd Ahern, Howard Rudsky, and Craig Hill. Hi, Doug. Are you available? I am, and hopefully you can hear me. We can. Hey, Paul. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak here tonight. I've never spoken before the council or the public either, for that matter, but tonight I must speak out on our behalf. My name is Doug Sandler, and my wife, Leslie, and I raised our two sons in our home in Malibu Park and have been part of this community for over 27 years. That is until we lost it in the fire. Both our kids attended all the local schools here in the city, including Children's Creative Workshop. Thank you, Sherry. My wife was a fixture at Malibu Fitness every day. Malibu has been our extended family for almost half our lives. We know all the shop owners, cashiers in the markets, teachers, coaches, friends and their kids and neighbors too, even some members of this council. Sadly, we lost our home in the Woolsey Fire and have been trying to work our way through the approval process to come home to Malibu in a slightly different version of the home that we lost. But we recently learned from the planning department that the approval process for plans like ours and APR have been frozen and cannot move forward in any way at this time. This is devastating news to learn after having been told by this same planning department that what we were proposing to build would not be an issue. We're not developers. We're not trying to build some McMansion. We're trying to rebuild a home that's approximately 200 square feet larger than what was approved on our footprint. Not an 8,000 square foot home or one that's even larger. All we wanted to do and all we want to do is come home to our community. This has been heartbreaking to say the least. We are displaced and have not been settled since the Woolsey fire, as well as the expense of carrying two properties, one we own and the other our rental. Every delay costs us tens of thousands of dollars, not to mention what we've spent even to get this far. And now to have this freeze placed on all the APR approvals when we're so close to being able to move forward, feels like being let down by the same community we've called home for so long and are longing to come back to. Council, please help us recover from this tragedy. The mere fact that we need to, to even ask for your help seems so absurd. Why should we be having to fight with the city of Malibu or the community to try and rebuild the home that we lost to a wildfire? The city should be doing everything in their power to assist homeowners like us to be able to rebuild and go home. It feels like the message being given is, we don't want you or anyone else who lost their home here in the fire, or we're just, we're just gonna treat you like a developer rather than the human beings that we are who also happen to be fire victims. We understand there, there may be issues whereby some individuals are trying to job the system to obtain their permits for a profit, but we're simple homeowners who lost their home and are trying to rebuild a home to start our lives over. It's simply heartbreaking. Our property has so much meaning to our entire family. We could have abandoned the property and just moved on, but we chose to rebuild. On our lot, crappy insurance and all. Doug, that's your time. Thank you, Doug. Our next speaker is Lloyd Ahern, followed by Howard Rudsky, Craig Hill, and Alan Karen. Lloyd, are you available? Do you hear me, Lloyd? Lloyd, we're asking you to unmute. Lloyd's on the phone. Um, so he has to press, I believe it's star six or star nine to unmute. Okay, I'm a, I'm unmuted. There he goes. Now, so thank right. you guys. Listen, um, I was I, I I was gonna have a speech, but everybody has said it. Um, Joe Drummond has walking right into a political avalanche. I mean, she has no idea. She she's got to be the biggest rookie in town to think that she could after the slowest start in the world about rebuilding and then all of a sudden call the coastal commission it's like calling in the glue nothing's going to happen she is going to be a pariah and as far as how she talks about karen when karen gets through with her and explains and, and shows her exactly what happened and how she built her house and the ethics that karen has compared to this woman joe drummond who talks like uh I don't know. She's going to end up in a in a nut war, you know, writing letters to Sam Hall Kaplan. So, good luck tonight, folks. Thank you, Lloyd.
Our next speaker is Howard Rudsky, followed by Craig Hill, Alan Karen, and Scott Dietrich. Howard, welcome back. Oh, thank you. It's been a long time. This is wrong on so many levels, and I've got five different versions so far of what the hell happened. I ask the city council to tell whoever manages a website on the website, the front page, right on the top, say what happened, what Joe Drummond did, what was the outcome of it, who's affected by it, so all the citizens can see exactly what was done and how it was done. This needs to be 100% transparency and what the city's going to do about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Redsky. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Alan, Karen, Scott Dietrich, and Ryan. Hey, Craig, are you available? Yes. Good evening, Mayor Grisanti, council, staff, everybody. Um, I'm not going to wade into the issue that everybody's talking about tonight. It might come before the planning commission. Um, so I'll, I'll keep my powder dry on that one. But um, I just, a very short while ago, I was doing my little exercise routine here uh, with in front of the big windows that look out over the cliff that nobody could ever see in and um, not, not wearing much. And I suddenly looked out and saw that there was a drone hovering right outside my window, just watching me. Very creepy. And it reminded me that I've heard various people uh, in recent months wondering about just what the legal status is of drone use in Malibu. I took a quick look on the website, didn't see anything too dispositive. And so uh, not tonight, not, you don't need to address it in your comments tonight, but it would be great if we could get uh, like a web page that just says, here are the rules, here's what you need an authorization for, here's what, where and when you don't need an authorization, if that's even true anymore. Um, and, you know, just off the top of my head, I remember reading a few years ago that uh, that you needed authorization within X miles of an airport. I think it was five miles and the sheriff's helicopter station uh, would qualify as that, which would make much of central Malibu off limits to drones. Um, anyway, it would be great to, to, to get some clarity on that for folks uh, in due time. And maybe uh, I noticed that um, former lieutenant, now Captain C2 is in the meeting. Congratulations. And maybe we could get a word from the sheriff at some point too about just uh, what, what the role of drones is in, in our community these days. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. It looks like Alan Karen has been disconnected from the meeting at the moment. So we'll circle back and we'll hear from Scott Dietrich next, followed by Ryan, Josh Siegel and Lester Tobias. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members and staff. Um, I'm gonna try once more on this subject, which is the big ugly tower. And uh, I guess I don't, think Richard's in the meeting, maybe Adrian can give us an update. But I did talk to Richard about it. And uh, I was asking specifically, didn't it need story poles? And he said, no, not really, because it was just replacing the old tower. But the old tower was so different. Nobody was objecting to the old tower. And We've discussed this. I won't go into the details about it being used for other things, but it seems to me that things are slipping through planning that really need to come because we suddenly end up with this big, ugly tower that nobody likes. I mean, none of you guys like it. The citizens don't like it. And so I'm, I'm going to address that in the commission assignments, but uh, we've, we've got to, to protect ourselves. Now, I wasn't gonna say this, but hearing the Alfano's talk, uh, I, I mean, there's something wrong with our current rebuild process. I'm not a contractor. I don't know what it is specifically, but the idea of it taking three years to get a rebuild that's just the same plus 10 is, is insane. And we need to fix it. 
that's got to be a priority. One of the priorities for our city, for you guys as council members, um, we're putting our, our residents, it's bad enough to lose your house, and then we put them through hell. It's no wonder so many people walked and just sold the land. Friend of mine in Flagstaff was trying to buy a house, couldn't find one he liked. So in one year, he bought a lot at Abutsta National Forest and built a house in one year from buying to completion to move in. We got a big problem and we need to fix it. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Josh Spiegel, followed by Lester Tobias, and Terry Lukoff. Mr. Embry, uh, thank, are you available? Thank you and good evening. I'm also going to mention the antenna tower that it is um, not, it's a pole at 23555 West Civic Center Way, and the city needs to notify the county to remove it, to take it down. It is unauthorized construction. And why the city would be treating the county as any other business entity, because this poll is for commercial purposes to make money off of Verizon Wireless. And it was not integrated into the project as was is required by the city code for stealth and for camouflage and so forth. And those codes were on the books and well known at the time. And I spoke to this item during some planning and scoping meetings of the um, um, Santa Monica College. Um, and I'm going to dig up those notes because this was not uh, included and it is not integrated and it's not even permittable under its current configuration. The, the second issue I wanted to raise though is a lot of hoopla that's going around about the speculators who are buying burnout lots and trying to build a maximum project for the most economic return. Whether or not they claim they're gonna live in it or not, who knows, you know, Paul, you, real estate is transferable and it's a huge industry. And I get that, that burnout victims want to build a bigger house and the extra 10% was automatically granted. But to go beyond that is a jeopardy that is going to complicate and take longer to process. And to that point, the serial development of additional square footage beyond 110% is gonna to have to be analyzed by the city for public safety and code compliance, structural geology, the, the septic and the whole bit. And I, I think I wanna defend the council here is that you're getting a lot of badgering by people who are simply stating random uh, facts, but they're not revealing those. So when a project is submitted and if they make changes or if they decide they wanna do a serial add-on or expansion or add a pool, these things are going to complicate and those should not be done at the expense of those people who are waiting in line to build what they had or what they had plus 10 percent. And that's the bigger issue. It's basically cutting in line in front of the other folks who were the true victims who are rebuilding for reoccupancy and not the investors or the flippers. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Josh Spiegel, followed by Lester Tobias and Terry Lukoff. Hi, Josh. Are you available? I am available. Thank you very much for having me. Um, if I sound a little bit uh, dim tonight, uh, I have COVID and the brain fog is real. Um, you know, I did want to talk, I did want to speak a little bit about what's going on with the possible retraction of option number four. And just as this as a whole, as, as, a, as kind of stepping back a little bit and just trying to understand where Malibu is going, um, it's very hard for young families and people who aren't extremely wealthy to break into this Malibu market. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, people used to come out to Malibu, buy a lot, dirt cheap, and, uh, get some permits, build a little house. 
Um, we can't do that anymore, you know, mainly because there aren't too many vacant lots left in the city. But, you know, it's too expensive and it's too time consuming to do anything. And once people start complicating and wanting, wanting you know, everything to be a coastal development permit, um, you know, when Steve was first, you know, on the, when he was first on the planning commission, you know, CDPs used to take two years. Um, CDPs now are five years, 10 years, a million bucks to get through there. And we're just, we're just pricing, you know, good, hardworking people out of Malibu. And that's part of the reason why, you know, Malibu is changing. It's not the, not necessarily the new Whole Foods or the new La Paz project or, you know, the nice cars or whatever. It's, it's a whole, it's a whole shift to this where it's too hard to break into Malibu. And I just, I just want to throw that out there and we need to be helping people get into their houses, making things easier. It, we can't make things more difficult. And, you know, I just find it really interesting that, you know, this, this woman who is leading the charge against, you know, we got to do this properly. And, uh, nah, nah. you know, she has code violations on her short term rental, you know, who, it's it's astounding to me that that she would go and file a lawsuit when she herself isn't following the rules. And it's just it's astounding. Anyway, I, I hope that you all have a very good evening. And oh, I do want to make one suggestion to Parker. Now that I now that I have Parker, I'm thinking about it. When we post on YouTube the, all the the various commissions and, and the council stuff, could we put a link in the comments to the agenda? that's uh that corresponds with that video i think that would be really helpful anyway thank you parker thank you council thank you everyone else for your civic uh, contribution thank you josh our next speaker is lester tobias followed by terry lukoff and bill sampson and lester are you available i am i'm assuming you guys can hear me we can all right good evening guys i'm assuming you got my six point email um, sort of legislatively discussing uh, this uh, option number four. Uh, I don't want to go over that. I, I threw a couple things together today. Um, you know, every now and then we we have this this sort of discussion about Malibu's being overrun and overdeveloped, and you know, this is another run at that that sort of you know concern. So. I decided to take a look at my own office's fire rebuild projects. Uh, I wanted to see if we actually had this existential program uh, problem, you know, with overdevelopment of these fire rebuilds. So we did twelve fire rebuilds, um, which I think makes is about five a five percent sample of all fire rebuilds with building permits. So here's what I found: uh, of the twelve projects, uh, only three of ours used this two-step APR process. Of this. Of these three projects, the average size increase was 52% of the original square footage, which on next door Canaan is known as the 152% size increase. So, you know, that's what that is. Now, the square footage of that 52% is 100 is 1,500 square feet, 1,500 square feet. So these are, these are 1,500 square foot additions. The average final size of these projects is 4,596 square feet. The average allowable TDSF of these three parcels is 6,619 square feet. So now of all the, of the 12 Woolsey projects in my office, the average allowable TDSF is 7,092 square feet. The average house size before rebuilding, 4,565 square feet. The average house size after rebuilding, 4,967 square feet. So when you average them all out, right, it's close to 10%. So this notion, at least my personal and professional experience, the notion that everybody's overbuilding and is, is just, it doesn't ring true in my office. Now, if somebody wants to come up and find all the projects that are going to the max TDSF and prove that I'm an outlier, I have no problem being, you know, proven wrong on that. But my conclusion is, you know, um, the the real the the real world sort of 
you know, issue here is, is it, we're, it's not an existential threat to, to Malibu and, and that most people want a 5,000 square foot house if they're going to go to the trouble of permitting and building in Malibu. And this is, you know, from what I can tell, this is the acceptable minimum house size that the, the planning, you know, commission has agreed not to beat up on at hearings. And so I don't know why anyone would blow up the lives of fire rebuilders based on these statistics. Thank you. Thank you, Lester. Our next speaker is Terry Lukoff, followed by Bill Sampson. Hi, Terry, are you available? Terry, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Terry, you are unmuted. I want to touch on two things tonight. The first thing is that all the city council people are obligated to our history here in Malibu and the mission statement. And I have this feeling that we keep making these little exceptions, uh, a hotel here or uh, something there. And I, I feel that Malibu is changing by a thousand little, little nicks, so to speak. It, it's death by a thousand little blade cuts, so to speak. And our mission statement is being destroyed. And I want to urge city council people to, to to be aware of our mission statement, especially on the developments. I'm upset that the city college at Civic Center was denied, a, uh, was granted to be 3,500 feet. And it was like, oh, well, it's a, it's a college. Well, now we're talking about a high school that wants to have 40 foot buildings at the end. That, what will slowly happen is it will disintegrate all, all of uh, Malibu. Uh, and I, I just think that that should not be done. My second comment is I actually am kind of following up with Lester in a certain way. I've found the Malibu building department to, to be really fabulous and the help of the people at the Malibu building department to be really good. Now, it, it did take me three years to get the permit for my house. But what I object to the most is the, so we start putting in the foundation and I go to put in one of the caissons and the geologist objects and says, this needs to be redone and to done, be done deeper. I went back to the city because the city needed to give the approval for this. It was built by the city as one hour of work, meaning the city looked at this and took one work, but one hour, but they sent it out for approvals to one of their off-site off sources uh, called First uh, Something or Other, and, and it sits for six, eight weeks. Now, my house has been sitting for eight weeks without any construction where we're waiting for something that took the city one hour to look at to, to be approved. Uh, the city needs to get control over their service providers in the building process. And, and that's probably your biggest failure is that you haven't gotten the uh, best supervision in doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Our next speaker is Bill Sampson, and then we have a few people to circle back to. Bill, are you available? I'm here, thank you. I recall a few months ago that several of the council members, including Mrs. Ferrer, attacked Bruce Silverstein, suggested he quit, suggested he be recalled, claimed he'd been involved in sexual, uh, sexually based harassment. That's sort of a generalized term. I don't remember the exact term. Um, sat on a report then for seven months. The report convicted Mr. Silverstein of, I guess, being rude. He hadn't done any of the stuff for which he is investigated, and three of you guys hid that. I'm now confronted with a council member who, if Mrs. Drummond is correct, managed to finesse the system on a spec rebuild following fire 
Mrs. Ferrer is not an unsophisticated real estate person. According to her filing, she holds 45 or 50 different real estate interests. Uh, that's a nice portfolio in anybody's book. I empathize greatly. I can't say I empathize. My house didn't burn down. I sympathize with the people who are trying to rebuild. Like for like plus 10%, I think that was the deal. If they can't, if they haven't been able to get that done, the city needs to look at it. But a spec rebuild under questionable circumstances, exhibiting a questionable ethic by a public official that got in front of the line on a spec rebuild is far worse than anything Mr. Silverstein actually did. So, Mrs. Ferrer says, the ability of a public official to finesse the system for her own personal aggrandizement is not a qualification to continue to hold that office. It's quite the contrary. If there is a factual basis for Mrs. Drummond's remarks, and there might well be, it sounds like there are certainly questions, it's time to quit. You should resign. It may even be what you did may have been legal that don't make it right. I am forced in my business frequently to tell people says, yes, what is illegal that is being done is shocking. What should shock you, however, is that which is done, which is purportedly legal. It wasn't right. It was wrong. It took advantage of a situation where people that should have been in front of you wound up behind you. It's far worse than what you accused Mr. Silverstein of doing and you asked him to quit. The shoe's on the other foot now. Walk out, please. Thank you. Our next speaker to circle back to is Ariel Vernon. Hey, Ariel. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for hearing me out. Um, I'd like to speak to the human element of the fire rebuilds um, and start by telling you that my husband and I are not fire victims. We purchased um, our lot on Blue Water and we are not developers. We've been on Point Doom for almost 15 years and we had this opportunity to build a home which we would live in. I have a baby and another one on the way and I feel like we're already a part of the Malibu community. We're entitled to build a 7,000 square foot home, but we opted for a more small, modest 4,000 square foot, one story home to fit us and the neighborhood. We wanna raise our family in Malibu, but we're not sure we'll be able to now. We have a rent that we're paying uh, for a condo. We have a mortgage and we wanna start putting down roots. Um, and I wanna say, if you don't want families like us in Malibu, then who are you looking for? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel. Our next speaker is Mark Martin. Mark, are you available? Yeah, sorry, does that, can everyone hear me now? We can hear you now, thank you. Two days of, two, two years of Zoom and that's what it takes to use this thing, apologies. Um, Hey everyone, Mark Martin. So I live in Malibu Park. Surprise, I'm here to talk about option four. And I think, you know, something kind of beautiful has happened. Look, I've, I've lived here for the better half of the last 25 years. I'm raising a young family here. And I'm not anyone who's interested in politics. Hats, hats off for you to stand up there and take the beating every day. So we appreciate it. That said, I had a speech. I'm going to can it because so many people have echoed what I was going to come here and say tonight, which is which is kind of great. Um, I'm not a developer by trade or profession. And like many in the community, I was just blindsided by this challenge to the legality of the option four. And it's just astonishing given so many people have spent hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to pursue this very clear path that the city has invited all of us to pursue. And I think there was a, look, I hear the opposing arguments here, and that's why we have a council. You know, everyone deserves a voice. I think, unfortunately, the time to have this discussion to dispute a lot of this, it, it was a good time about four years ago. And the ship has sailed, and so many decisions have been made around this that I wish we would all actually focus more on kind of the integrity and paths to 
expediting ad efficiency and easy for me to say from the outside, but I, I think reopening this, it's just, and I, I don't have to say it, there's enough lawyers in this town. I'm not one of them, but sounds like a pretty good precedent for a class action suit. That's not going to help our city staff or city planners get any more efficient for the rest of us who are trying to go through this process. So, look, I, I think the other mistake here, the notion that's been portrayed incorrectly is that the option for people are a bunch of faceless developers. I've heard hedge funds. I've even heard private equity firms. That's, it's just not true. I mean, so many of us are families that have been a, a part of this community for decades or longer. Like my kids are in the school system here. I've worked my whole life to pay for this opportunity to raise my family here. And so we're not all bad developers. We're just people that are trying to follow the rules. And I have a massive issue with anyone that thinks it's appropriate right now to go and just change the rule book under the entire population's feet. I just don't understand how you justify that as a human being or justify it as a from a legal standpoint. Either one is going to fall pretty hard, I think, on its face. And then there's the insinuation that this is really the cause of one person who took it upon themselves to initiate the Coastal Commission reinvestigating this topic. And that just alienates such a big portion of our population that's trying to do this by the rules. And I'm still trying to grasp that concept, but all I'll say is that's just not the productive way to go about this. Yes, we need boundaries. Yes, this can't be a closed, you know, endless loop for people to come in here and try to develop and use the Woolsey Fire code. But anyway, a lot of us are young families or people who love this community, and we don't want McMansions here either. So there, there's my three minutes. Thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is Julie Martin, followed by Alan Karen. Hi, Hi. Julie. I'll be forfeiting my minutes tonight. Everyone's echoed my uh, same sentiments on the Woolsey Fire rebuilds. Thank you Our for your brevity. <laughs> Our next speaker is Alan Karen. Hi, Alan. Are you available? Hi, yes, I'm here. Uh, I've got nothing to add. I think uh, everybody else spoke from the heart. Thank you. Thank you. Do we and have anybody are, else? I still don't see Dustin, uh, Kaylee, or Luca Ikovni in the meeting, and I don't have any other raised hands. So that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe that brings us to commission or committee updates. Do we have any? Commissioner committee updates? You do not have any commissioner committee updates tonight. Okay, well, we have a city manager. Perhaps he can update us. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I do have a report for you this evening. I'll try to keep it brief. It's been a few weeks since we met, so uh, uh, do you want to go through a few list of um, meetings that I did attend? Um, we did hold a meeting of the Malibu Public Facilities uh, Authority, sorry, Malibu Public Facilities Authority, back at the end of May, uh, heard an update on what is happening um, with the construction on the community college that is progressing. Uh, they expect the um, main part of the construction to wrap up around November or December. Uh, and from that point on, they will move into doing the interior improvements. Uh, so that is progressing well. I also attended a uh, meeting to talk about school safety, which was held uh, on Friday, May 27th, uh, not long after the horrible events that occurred in uh, Uvalde. Uh, and I know we have a meeting uh, uh, item on the agenda later for this evening, so I'll hold my comments um, until that time. Um, COVID, uh, we are continuing to see um, an increase in the test positivity rate. Uh, as of the report on June 8th, the county was reporting a 4.5% test positivity rate. That is twice the rate that they had been reporting a month ago. Uh, at that last reporting, they had just over 6,195 new cases. Hospitalizations are increasing uh, right now at an average of 550. Uh, we remain in what they consider to be the medium community transmission. Uh, but we are still moving up, uh, st uh, but still a ways to go from what they would consider to be the high community transmission rating, at which point um, we would be looking at some additional restrictions kicking in. So unfortunately, COVID is still here. And uh, as we enter into the summer months, um, 
we're going to need to continue to to watch that closely wanted to uh, also report that uh, the city uh, did approve um, uh, from the state of California, we were approved for some disaster assistance for the city's responses to the the one winter storm that we had in 2021. Although, as you recall, it was quite a large one. Uh, so we are we were successful in our application to the state uh, to receive some disaster funding for that. Also wanted to report that um, Caltrans will be holding a virtual community meeting about the PCH paving project uh, on June 28th. This will be a virtual meeting, Tuesday, June 28th from 6 to 7 p.m. The Caltrans PCH paving project will extend from approximately the Magooloon all the way out past the city limits to Leo Creo Beach, and it will restore pavement condition, improve ride quality, and address some upgrades along four curbs. And um, and there will be some added bike, bike lanes as well. So that will be uh, June 28th. And there's some information on the city website if you're interested in finding out more information on that. Also wanted to note that uh, we did hold a very successful public safety expo on Saturday, June 4th. I know several of you were there. I unfortunately was not able to attend. Had over 125 persons uh, at the events uh, with a, a number of vendors. Uh, including our Quake Cottage Earthquake Simulator, which was always a big hit. So thank you uh, to Captain C2 uh, and everybody who came out to make that event a success, uh, including all of our public safety volunteers and professionals. Also wanted to note that I did attend the graduations for uh, Malibu, Malibu Middle School and Malibu High School last week. Those are always wonderful uh, presentations uh, to be a part of. So thank you to the school district for that. And also wanted to report, as I believe I did at the last, at my last report, that we were waiting to see what the state and the county might be doing in terms of uh, drought and water restrictions. Uh, those are now in place. Uh, so there are restrictions on outdoor watering. I won't give all the details, uh, but you can find specifics in the city manager's update or on the city website. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. That is my report. Thank you very much, Steve. And if I could, Mr. Mayor, I would like to ask if Captain C2 is here and would like to uh, give a report as well. I'd Thank be you. delighted to recognize Captain C2. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We can hear you okay, and see fine. you too. And see me now. Um, so just to echo um, what um, city manager said is um, we did have a meeting about the school shootings and what are our ideas for, for the Malibu um, community? What does that look like? So we met with, um, with uh, Mayor Prasanti and Councilman Fair, as well as um, Isaac from the, uh, the district. And we had a frank discussion about what we can do to, to um, improve um, security within the Malibu schools. And so um, our follow-up meeting is tomorrow. So I look forward to that. And um, I think most of you guys have noticed that there was a large increase in police presence, not because we had any threats to the schools at all. It was just merely um, after an incident that's, that's normal practice is we do um, put additional personnel at schools. And since there were, um, not only did we do that, but also because of the large events being the graduations, um, we also had deputies um, attend those graduations and just provide high visibility patrol. So that was really what our main focus the last couple of weeks was, is just making sure that everybody felt comfortable going to school and going and actually celebrating their successes. They worked really hard um, for graduation and we wanted to make sure that they were honored and we did it in a safe manner. Um, so again, I look forward to our meeting tomorrow. And if there's any questions that you have for me regarding um, schools, any of that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I see Steve's hand and followed by Karen's. You're muted, Steve. 
Captain CQ, uh, in your meetings with the school, are you meeting with Patrick Miller also? Uh, so, yeah, so Patrick Miller couldn't make the first um, the first meeting, but he is in tomorrow's meeting, and Patrick and I have had subsequent conversations. Cool. Yeah, I talked to him earlier, but he got a good handle on, on now who high, so good yes, handle. He's, cool. he's gotcha. a fantastic partner. We've been friends for years. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Captain C2 and everybody involved for coming together so quickly in the wake of the Uvalde shootings. Uh, in a very short period of time, we were put, able to put together uh, Malibu Pathway Director Isaac Burgess, Captain C2, Lieutenant Waters, uh, Craig Foster, Mayor Grisanti, myself, City Manager McCleary, and Assistant City Manager Tony. And that all happened in just uh, from one afternoon to the next morning. So that was the kickoff meeting. And um, I can wait till my public comments to talk about the next meeting tomorrow, which is a larger group with more community partners. But I wanted to thank you, Captain C2, for being able to make that uh, come together so quickly and for your presentation that morning. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. And uh, Lieutenant Waters had a lot to do with it. He really organized the team and made sure that they were um, at every event. So thank you, Lieutenant Waters, for really handling everything. Any other uh, questions? Uh, can I change the subject a little bit about, we had quite a, uh, a bit of excitement in the last few days. And is there anything else you can tell us about uh, what went on at the Point Doom gas station? Yes. Um, so there was on Friday afternoon, um, there was a robbery at the gas station. And um, subsequently, someone was shot during the robbery. Um, there was a pursuit, and the the suspect did get away. Um, you know, oftentimes when we do pursuits, we got to look at risk versus gains, and um, you know the safety to the community as well. So, um, but uh, the case is at major crime, so I can't comment any further on the case. But they are uh, they are handling the case. I did speak to one of the detectives today, and this is something that's. You know, he's working on very, very hard. And um, yes, that's about all I can release at this time. Thank you. Anybody else? Steve? I, just, I have a question on another topic, if that's okay sure. for now. C Captain C2, I've heard a bunch of different stories about the summer beach team up at Zuma Beach. Uh, and, and some people said it's going to be reduced this summer. Other people said it's going to be the same. Do you, can you tell me where we are with that at the moment? You're muted. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Every time I mute myself, um, I have to be unmuted by somebody. Um, yeah, so um, from uh, my, and, um, I think Lieutenant Chad Waters is on the call as well, and maybe he can jump in a little bit. But from my understanding, the deputy level of the coverage of the beach team has stayed the same. And the, the reduction has been from um, uh, not as much um, super. So there's always a sergeant out there with the team, but less supervision, meaning like the lieutenants uh, not always out there. Like um, when Jim Royal was here, he was out there a lot at the beach with the beach team, as well as Sergeant Braden. Um, I believe that's where the cut came. It didn't actually come in with deputies. And uh, Lieutenant Waters, if you're on, if you could provide any other additional information, but that is my understanding. Okay, I am. I can follow up tomorrow, and I can send. Um, uh, oh, there's can, Chad. Oh, there's Chad. Hey, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. It was taking them a while to get me in here. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly it. There was a lot of fat that we needed to cut out from uh, excessive supervisor overtime, and that just didn't need to be there. Uh, we have a sergeant who's able to take care of the team. It's uh, anywhere from an eight to a twelve person team, depending on how many uh, or what the day of the week is and and what 
holiday it is. I think the most coverage we have is on July 4th. Other than that, it's about eight deputies, you know, six out on the beach in Zuma, three cover each direction. And then we have a two man team that goes out and works all the pocket beaches throughout the area. So it's not just Zuma's getting covered. You have somebody that's mobile driving up and down the coast the entire time. And that sergeant takes care of all of that. The only time we have two sergeants or a lieutenant, we have a lieutenant one day a week out there just to make sure everything is being monitored and being done properly. And two sergeants on the heavy days. Other than that, we have a lot of parking enforcement out there too, uh, which they, those they're worth their weight in gold. Those people really take care of keeping the roads clear and taking care of everything that needs to be done on the, uh, especially around the Zoom area with, in regards to the safety of the public with some of these people that are parking illegally and halfway out in the roadway and everything else on, on PCH. So when you're talking about that, uh, Steve, yeah, that's, that's it, sir. It's, uh, it's all about just cutting the fat. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. And thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Captain C2. Okay. I think that brings us to the City Council subcommittee reports. Do we have any? Uh, and then Mayor and City Council member meetings, attendance reports, and inquiries. Would any, who would like to present their council member report? Mikey, followed by Steve. Everyone seems shy, so I'll go first. Um, except for Steve. First of all, um, to Sherry Lotta, I just want to say again, thank you, thank you, thank you. You've made the difference in so many Malibu families' lives, so many children, so many parents over decades, our family included. And um, it's really, it's really heartfelt. And uh it means a lot to so many people, obviously uh, a huge amount of people contacted myself and I, I know others the last year or two as we tried to figure out options on your school and and um, I don't know that it worked out the way uh, we hoped, but here we are and um, I just I just can't say enough about what an amazing transcend, transcendental human you've been and uh, and to thank you so. And we'll see you around. Um, as to the option for discussion, I'm completely blindsided as well. I did not see this coming. And for the people that this is impacting, I hear your frustration. And um, I get it. I don't actually feel I quite know enough about what's going on and why. I'm a little lost on, on where we're at and where we're going. Um, it's, I think Josh Spiegel spoke well. It's so expensive and so time consuming to get us, you know, anything developed in Malibu um, and has been for a while that, to see any slowdown now is 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 difficult. Um, and for some of the speakers out there, please, please, please communicate when you feel stuck. Please, um, I get um, communications from a lot of people, sometimes multiple a day, and don't don't sit there frustrated and expect and wonder why you're not hearing back. Please reach out to me or you know directly to the city, to Yolanda, but I'm glad to help. And I have been helping a lot of people. Um, and I would, a, a special note for the Alfanos, as far as I can see in paperwork, your project is approved. So if there's something holding you up, please get a hold of me um, or Yolanda and let's figure out what's going on because we want to keep you moving. Back to option four, you know, from where I sit, um, we're just trying to get families back in their homes. I know it may not be perfect. I know looking back years later, maybe we could dissect it a bit, but at the time it, it, you know, I was elected two days before the fire and that fire hit and was so overwhelming and so life-changing that 
you know, a lot of us did our very, very best to get things going. And it hasn't been easy. You know, since then, we've uh, had the pandemic. We've lost a huge amount of staff. It's like every other business. It's really hard to find employees. I'm not making up excuses. Just the reality of where we're at has been really tricky. And yes, maybe 80 or so are approved, whatever the number is today. A lot more houses are closed and we need to get them done because this has been a long, painful process. And whatever it takes, however we figure this out, um, I'm on board with that. Um, that's the highest priority. To uh, Ariel, I think it was Ariel, yeah, we want families. We want your family. That's exactly what we want. I mean, to have families, young families, building a Malibu is everything this community is about. I uh, attended uh, the high school and the middle school graduations last week. And I was really just struck by, I thought to myself, this is, this is the core of what Malibu is about. This is community. And you looked at this group of kids and you looked at their families, um, whether on the football field or in the amphitheater. And I, I don't know, I found it super heartfelt. My kids are much older now, you know, and I found myself looking around going, heck, I went to Juan Cabrillo <laughs> and just it's being torn down now. I mean, it's been a long run here and uh, my kids went to the schools and anyhow, not going down memory lane here. Um, besides that, um, I've been working uh, with our group with Karen on school separation. We've had multiple meetings. That will continue. We are not giving up. It's a process. It's always tricky. You know, our side feels really, really solid. Um, and um, hopefully we'll have we'll have news soon. Hopefully it's really good news. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, other couple of uh, activities I had during our break was uh, I toured uh, parts of Western Malibu with uh, Steve McClary, city manager Steve McClary. And um, we got a little bit waylaid because we ended up, oh, wait, we ended up at the high school <laughs> and talking about how we rebuild the school and how we bring back more of that sense of community we were just talking about, I was just talking about. So thank you. Uh, thank you, City Manager McClary, for that. Uh, I think we probably owe ourselves one more attempt at doing a little bit more, because. but it was important to go to the high school. And also got the chance to meet our new assistant city attorney, uh, Joe Tony, and that was great. And I appreciate it. His, what's that? You're mouthing something. I'm, I'm sorry. You said city attorney. I just wanted to make assistant. Didn't I say assistant? Oh, I meant you the word assistant. assistant was in my head. Manager. Assistant's correct. The city assistant city manager. All right. Well, don't get run over by a bus or anything, or else it will be city manager Tony. So um, I thank you for your time too, and uh, I'll keep it brief. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Steve Uring, please. Hey, thank you, Paul. Uh, you know, the letter we got back from the Coastal Commission on option four, have, have, you, have we published that? I mean, I'm getting calls from architects saying, what did the Coastal Commission say? And I don't know the answer. I mean, maybe it came out and I missed it. Is, there re is that letter available? Whatever they're... Councilor Muring, that, that came to the city via an email on May 25th, directly to Richard, uh, from Denise Gonzalez at the Coastal Commission to Richard Malika. A few people were copied. Uh, a press release, and Steve uh, McClary can correct me if I'm wrong, but a press release did go out from uh, Mr. Meyerhoff. And we have sent a letter to Coastal Commission requesting a meeting to discuss the issue. It will eventually come back to you, obviously, and the council to determine what's going to go on. So has that specific email been published? I don't know other than to say that a press release has gone out. Okay, I gotta start paying closer attention, I apologize. Uh, I, I attended the public safety co uh, commission, the public safety conference that took place at City Hall. Uh, excellent job, and I wanna thank Sarah Kaplan, uh, who I know was you know, intimately involved in putting that together. I know she worked hard with the uh, CERT to make it happen. So you did a hell of a job again. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I also want to thank the poll workers who were doing the uh, election thing in, in City Hall. Uh, I made a couple trips there with, I deposited my mail in bail. I mean, these people were great. They were friendly, they were helpful, they were 
uh, had a great attitude. So I, I don't know them. I wish I did, but somebody should take them out and buy them a beer because they did do a heck of a job and made that whole voting process a lot easier. I got a call this, this last week uh, from the folks in Sarah Retreat regarding the Ringe Dam and state parks. And the word that they had was that state parks had gotten a some funding from the legislature and they were responsible for putting together a plan to remove Ringe Dam. Uh, now that was the first I heard of that. So I talked, I called Rob DeBoe. I don't know if Rob's on the in the meeting still. Uh, and see if he had any additional information. I don't see him. So I are you there, Rob? Ah, there he is. Okay. Uh, and Rob was kind enough to go out and do some research and let me know what was going on. So, Rob, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I, I, um, Steve, you're right. They um, contacted state parks. They did get some state funding to start the design process of removing Ringe Dam. Um, that's is about the most information that I got out of them. One thing that I got out of them was quite promising it, is that uh, they, they are going to reach out to us and be a collaborative approach and get information on what went on on the whole process of everything. So uh, once I know more, I'll be able to pass that information over to the council. Thank you. Yeah, I think they got like 11 million bucks or something to, to do the plan. I can't what was that? I, I thought that I thought you said they got like $11 million grant to do yeah. the plan. Uh, and it was interesting because I couldn't figure out why it went to state parks and not to the Corps of Engineers. And I, but yeah, uh, I, that's, that's that was a good question too because I remember and, the, the uh, Army Corps was the one that was doing it before. Yeah. So we'll, I mean, that's we'll kind of see where this goes, and and I'll be happy to give updates and cool. definitely yeah. make sure we can get our um, issues resolved. Yeah, keep the people in Sarah retreat as much as you can inform because you know they're they got a whole bunch of issues. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, car show. Steve McClary, city manager McClary, do we know that did the shopping center ever put up those signs they said they were going to put up? I'm glad you asked me that question now and not a week ago because they have got them up. Uh, Lieutenant Waters confirmed that for me, uh, and he told me that they were issuing citations over the weekend. So okay. they finally did get them up. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, That's all I got. Back to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, not seeing anybody else's hand. I'm going to take a moment and do mine. Uh, I, I, uh, oh, Karen, I'm sorry. Please, Karen. Thanks, Paul. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of the public speakers. Um, and I too want to thank Shari Lada, uh, having done child development here for the last 40 years. Uh, I'd be surprised, um, and it probably is the case, that she has had preschool students who were the children of previous preschool students. And Sherry, I just want to thank you for the huge positive impact you've had on the entire community for so many years. And as Mikey said, um, you and he and I spoke several times to try to figure out another location or work something out. I am really, really happy that you were able to finish out the school year um, and didn't have to uh, leave early from your location on uh, Santa Monica Malibu Unified property. So at least that part worked out, but I'm, I too am really sorry to see your school close. Um, let's see, I'll go through my council activities and then I will address option four. So um, obviously we've had a lot of really sobering news. We had the Uvalde school massacre, just one more out of too many to count at this point. So obviously, like everybody, this local community is concerned about it. And that's why in a short period of time, we put together the meeting that we did with uh, Captain C2, uh, the Malibu Pathway Director, our only Malibu School Board member, and the others that I already named. Uh, we do have a meeting tomorrow with a large contingent of uh, community partners, uh, parents, teachers, principals, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, the ELAC, 
or English language learning community. Uh, and this whole group is coming together tomorrow uh, and Captain C2 will be running that meeting and providing uh, her ideas for options for us to consider. Uh, the attempted robbery and the shooting of the clerk at the Point Doom gas station is just almost as bad as it, as it gets. I'm very sorry the suspect was not caught and I am very hopeful that he will be. Uh, I was told that there were seven accidents on Pacific Coast Highway on Saturday. So in case anybody's wondering, summer is here. Please be aware when you're on the highway, people are driving around, they're lost, they're distracted. We've got pedestrians running across the highway. They're unfamiliar with the dangers, the canyons. Many, many people have no idea how serious it is. So I just wanna just ask anyone listening to please think about that. Uh, Mayor Grisanti and I participated in a Los Angeles County City Selection Committee meeting. That was on May 24th. Uh, at that meeting, I was appointed to a second term on the LA County Library Commission, representing the third supervisorial district. I'm one of two members representing the third supervisorial district. Commission member duties pertain to advising on matters of library policy administration, operation, and service. Uh, also on May 26th, I attended an in-person meeting at City Hall regarding the possible installation of an emergency broadcast radio antenna. That was with City Manager McCleary, Public Safety Commission Chair Chris Frost, Vice Chair Doug Stewart, Planning Director, Director Richard Mollica, and potential service provider Hans Letts of Radio Malibu 99.1 FM. So uh, again about the uh, meeting tomorrow, uh, it's now become known as the School Safety Partnership. There will be more to report on that after it takes place. Um, other council activities also on May 27th, I attended SoCal Edison's um, clean energy financing proposal meeting. Two years ago, I was asked by Rudy Gonzalez at SoCal Edison to be the government advisory panel representative for the Northwest region. So I went to this virtual meeting uh, regarding the clean energy financing proposal. I'm happy to provide information uh, or a link to that presentation if anybody is interested. And um, maybe Matt Meyerhoff would do a, uh, a, uh, a public service announcement on that. Um, I had an introductory meeting with our assistant city manager, Joe Tony, and city manager, Steve McClary. And again, welcome aboard to Joe. As Mikey said, we are continuing our school separation weekly meetings. And we have a date, which hopefully will stick for our next mediation of July 9th. Uh, I also attended the school, the uh, Public Safety Expo uh, on June 4th. I really wanna thank everybody involved, as Steve said. Um, Sarah, who I believe headed up the entire thing. All the people who attended, although I did hear from most um, of the volunteers and uh, people at the booths that they really thought attendance was light. I hope that in the future we get greater attendance at that. It's a lot of work to put on and there's a lot of very, very good information. I also attended the Malibu High graduation. Uh, and as Steve McClary said, it's just an incredibly up uplifting event. As Mikey said, it's a huge community gathering. And what Mikey and I discussed and Patrick Miller was that this graduating class had a lot of students who were the youngest member of their family. So there were families who've been in the school system for 15, 20, 25 years, been in the community even longer. And it was really the end of an era for Malibu High. So I just congratulate all of those people and also the elementary and middle school students that promoted. So talk about option four. I'll leave my questions for later. Um, regarding 
uh, some emails that were received and public speakers tonight, Lynn Saunders, Joe Drummond, Bill Sampson. I have a suggestion. Do yourself a favor, spend a few minutes on Zillow. Look at the history of this project and of this property. Let's talk about that. So much has been fabricated. It's astounding to me the lengths that people are willing to go to, to try to fit something into their political narrative. So that property was originally put on the market in November of 2017, a year before the fire. That's how much the owner wanted to sell it. It went back on the market after the fire. It wasn't selling. It went through multiple price reductions. The owner lowered the price numerous times. She hired an architect. She had plans, architectural renderings drawn up to make it more marketable. She marketed it as a package with her son acting as her broker. Land, plans, and planning approval when it was for sale. In February of 2019, the council unanimously passed motions to address Woolsey fire rebuilds. February of 2019. 18 months later, our family bought that property with the intent that our daughter would move back to the town that she was born and raised in, along with Bill Sampson's daughter, Margaret, and Kendall Gilbert, Lynn Saunders' daughter. They all went to Malibu High together, same grade. In fact, my daughter tutored Nick Sanders, Nick Sandler in high school and many other local students. So my daughter, with her growing family, wanted to move to Malibu and come back here after being away for many years for college, grad school, and starting their careers. It's the kind of family that many people in this town say that they would like to see more of here. And we've heard people say that tonight. Young families with kids who can go to our local schools. This is the welcome they're getting, or in my daughter's case, the welcome back. The property was purchased for less than 2% under the asking price. That purchase was in September of 2020. Again, 18 months after the council unanimously passed the Woolsey rebuild motions. So for those who have said I should have recused myself from those votes, I don't have a crystal ball. I didn't know any such purchase was going to be made. Neither I nor my family have done anything wrong. So let's stop right there. And I have another suggestion. Ask Yolanda Bundy, ask Richard Mollica, ask the city attorneys, ask the city manager, do any actual or factual research and let us all know what you find out. Then, by all means, please post the real story on social media and anywhere else you've been defaming me. What we did was utilize an option offered by the city and implemented, according to Yolanda Bundy, by 30% of the rebuilds, be they original owners or people who bought those properties after the fire. This social media phenomenon amounts to nothing short of character assassination of me and defamation of my entire family. Sadly, but predictably, all of these fabrications are politically motivated. They are not based in fact. They are designed to damage someone perceived as a political rival. They're straight out of the Trump playbook. They are lies, conspiracy theories, inciting others. And guess what? I find this to be a very sad day for Malibu. It's time to get out of the gutter. 
And now for my questions about option four. So I know Richard is not here tonight. I'm not sure who's answering on behalf of planning. How many projects are now on hold? That's my first question. Hi. I see Adrian. Hi, Adrian. Thank yes, you. Hi. All right, give me a second. All right, so um, we have um, 26 projects that are currently on hold um, that would take advantage of the, uh, you know, the additions over 10%. So the second uh, coastal permit exception. 26. Okay. And let's just be clear, was this due to an appeal with the Coastal Commission? Uh, it was not, no. Okay. Was this a Coastal Commission agenda item? Was this a vote by the Coastal Commission? Uh, this was not. Uh, this was a um, letter we received from Coastal staff. Letter from Coastal staff. Okay. And um, can you talk about the history of this or, or anyone else involved? city manager or city attorney. What was the genesis of this email from the coastal staffer? So, um, I guess uh, what you're asking for is um, who was coastal staff responding to? Is that basically the question? Sure. Whatever you know about it. And um, well, um, the Coastal Commission email uh, included um, Joe Drummond's um, correspondence to them. So they were, in a sense, responding to her email or her, you know, um, comments they, that she made to them. And do you know, Adrian, or uh, anyone else, city attorney or manager, was there any particular project or address referenced in Joe Drummond's email to the coastal staffer? Um, I think uh, there may have been just your address, I believe. Only mine. That's so interesting. But now, because of that inquiry, there are 26 other families with their projects on hold. I think we might be looking at unintended consequences, but that's just my perception. So let's continue on. Karen, Ms. Ferrer, I... I... I have more questions, John. I think I understand I'm to this ask is, them. This is, I, I understand, and I, I'll let you continue, but keep in mind, this is not an agendized item. You did respond to the comments, and now we're getting, you did mention that this item is coming back to the, it will eventually come back to the to the council. So, okay. you have I have more questions, I understand, but. A couple more. Okay. So, um, as Yolanda has told me, and if anybody wants to confirm or give another number, I welcome you to. Uh, I was told that option four was utilized by 30% of rebuilds. I think that number is actually smaller than 30%. Um, we have 45 applications that have been approved um, under that option four. That's 45 applications. Um, that's uh, out of the total uh, 240 applications. So um, the percentage is 19%. Okay, I see Yolanda. Thank you, Adrian. I see Yolanda here. I'm not sure, maybe I heard her wrong or maybe she has a different interpretation. Um, when the question, good evening, city council, when this questions arose, and this is learning from other fires because I've been part of other fires, about 30% of the properties that get uh, they get destroyed are usually sold or they're not developed by the uh, original property owner. Oh, maybe that was the 30% number. Yeah, that's, okay. That, that is a different question. Um, and I think we have the numbers on that as well. Um, and I believe that is about um, a 20% in uh, currently. Uh, so about 20% of all the fire rebuilds um, that uh, took advantage of the uh, second exemption or the stacking um, uh, were property owners that were not the original victims. Okay, um, and then I have one more related question. If option four is eliminated, what impact 
do you think that could have on the value of a burnout property that a Woolsey survivor is trying to sell? So that's a, probably a, not a question for me to answer since I don't do valuations of property. So I, I couldn't really uh, be able to provide you an answer uh, or a number to that. Um, obviously they would, they wouldn't be able to build the house that, you know, bigger house that they would want. So there would be some value impact. I don't know what that would be though. Okay, thank you, uh, both Adrian and Yolanda. Um, and I have just a few closing remarks about that particular property. The plans approved by the planning department were for a three bedroom, two bathroom home of 2,703 square feet. The maximum building height of 18 feet is exactly what the house is. No part of it is over that. And the building footprint is exactly the same as the home that burned down. After the permit was received from building and safety for the above project, we, as many others have done, applied for an administrative plan review for an additional 745 square feet or a 21.6% increase in building size. The number's been thrown around. We added 40%, 50%. Was that just another convenient political narrative? It seems like it to me. So the accusations uh, that this was a spec development, uh, a no interest loan to my daughter and her husband so that they could live there with their two kids and maybe more in the future, that's not a spec development. So we've been falsely accused by getting special treatment from the city on permits and approvals. Our submissions were pro processed by our architect. We paid all fees. We got in line with the other applicants. No favors were sought, none were provided. There's no evidence of any such favors being sought or provided. Anybody, anybody who wants to, to, do, to do a public records request can do that. And so what's the, uh, what's the reward in my family's case? for wanting to have an adult child move back with her two children. Well, uh, Bill Sampson has called me both a bottom feeder and a scumbag. I don't appreciate that. That sounds like defamation to me. So thank you. Those are my comments. Thank you, Karen. Bruce, would you like to go? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to try to be very brief because I know we have a long agenda and it's it's already late. Um, I have a question, first of all, about the meeting tomorrow, uh, the safety meeting. It, are more than two council members permitted to attend that meeting, or is that a Brown Act issue? John? Can Mayor you Tom Silverstein, if, if this is an open public meeting, open, open and publicized meeting of another body that's otherwise open to the public, you are, prohib you are uh, permitted to attend, assuming... Okay. You're invited. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about the meeting, so I can't speak to it. But well, is it what you just described an open meeting of another body? This is the first I'm hearing about it. I can do some research and let you know once I see the. It sounds like it is. It sounds like it's open to everybody in the community, and it's been publicized and open to uh, and available to everybody in the community. And if that's the case, then you would be permitted to attend. K Karen, uh, may, may, your I, head now. may I? If if I can just answer that, um, the the list of community members attending was by recommendation of the school principals, uh, the ELAC English language learning community, uh, and uh, perhaps the two faculty members. But th this was a recommended list. Uh, th this was not an open meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, because I want to make sure that I don't run afoul of the Brown Act if I were to attend. I'd like to, but I, I won't. Um, I'm just going to talk about this option for a thing. First of all, Karen, you know, I, I know it's not fun to be personally attacked um, at these meetings and elsewhere. So um, I empathize with the, what's been going, with what just went on and um, appreciate your response. Um, time will tell what's, what, what this is all about, but um, I know that's not any fun. It, 
Karen mentioned unintended consequences. I'm going to say that that's something I've talked about since the election. Um, we have laws, and when we cut corners and bend those laws, there are unintended consequences. And this, unfortunately, I believe was a situation. Not, not, I'm not talking about Karen. I'm talking about the, the, the option four, where corners were cut and laws were bent, which is why we find ourselves here today in a position that we never would have been had those corners not been cut and laws not been bent in the first place. And, and I don't believe it was done innocently and unintentionally or unknowledgeably. I'm not saying it was done for bad reasons. I think it was done for very good reasons. But that's what happens when you cut corners and you bend the law. Um, there's an expression in, in, in court that said that bad facts make bad law. And I think this is one of those situations. I, I think that there were the best of intentions, but here we are today. And I hope we can find a way to ensure that, I, I've always, I talk about this all the time, our primary residents who lost their home, who are seeking to get back into their home, um, who in this case are already in the pipeline and who are finding their plans frozen. I hope we can find a way to expeditiously unfreeze them and move them forward. Different issue for others, but I hope that at a minimum we can do that. I, I will say also, based on my knowledge of what's been going on with the rebuilds, and I could be wrong, but, but I think this is, this is accurate. The, the vast majority of the delays, the homes that don't have permits that, that aren't even beginning yet, the issue is dollars. The issue is not our building, our planning department. Um, people who lost their homes or under, most people who lost their homes were underinsured. They required assistance from SCE who caused the fire. And it, the, the legal system takes a long time to wind through. And that's unfortunate. Um, but the reason we only have 70 rebuilds so far and only whatever the larger number is that are in the pipeline is because many people didn't have the money to be even begin the process. Um, also, you know, most people most people don't want to build a house. I know I'm one of those people. I, I've only bought in the past houses I could move into that were already built by someone else, because building a house is a huge headache. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's it's just not something that you want to do. And a lot of people who lost their homes don't want to have to rebuild um, for all kinds of reasons. But you know. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that same issue later tonight with the STR issue. Again, it's, you know, bending, bending laws, cutting corners, result in unintended consequences. Um, you know, for Joe Drummond, I, I know this personally from the things I've gone through here. It's, it, you know, it's easy to be quiet. It's harder to stand up for when you see something that you believe is wrong and, and, and say something about it and do something about it. And, um, you know, don't shoot the messenger. All she did was bring to the Coastal Commission's attention what she believed to be an unlawful um, scheme. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a fraudulent sense, a scheme, a, a, a program that was not appropriate under the Coastal Commission, under the Coastal Act, under our local coastal program. And um, the Coastal Commission is now enforcing its rules. Um, you know, only one person who spoke tonight, Lester Tobias, actually spoke about, um, is it, is this an accurate um, result where we are now, or is it wrong legally? Um, I know Lester was one of the people who first initiated this process, this scheme. Um, he believed it was appropriate and legal. Um, he may be right, he may be wrong. We do need to get to the bottom of that and find out. Um, so, I'm just looking at my notes here. You know, just, just one point I want to make is, you know, it's like, and I know this is a very controversial subject, but, you know, anyone who's halfway awake in this country is aware of the leaked decision of the U.S. Supreme Court that's going to come out that's going to overrule um, Roe v. Wade. Um, legal scholars will tell, I mean, will tell you that was a very controversial decision when it was rendered in 1972, I believe it was. It probably bent the law. It probably it cut corners. It did so to get to a result that was socially desirable to the majority of the population. That result is probably, unfortunately, desirable to a less large portion of the population today. And you talk about unintended consequences. Had the Supreme Court not broke, had not bent the law and made a decision of a judge made decision as opposed to gotten the states to amend the Constitution we wouldn't be in the position we're in today. 
It's the same kind of thing. When you, when, again, when you cut corners, when you bend the law, you have unintended consequences when things come full circle down the line. And this could have been addressed in 2000. Paul, I'm, let me finish. This could have been addressed in 2019 properly. And it was, it was, it was understood that this option was problematic and that the Coastal Commission would never bless it if it were presented directly. So what happened? In order to accomplish what was perceived to be a good result for the residents and for others, we cut corners and bent the law and didn't ask Coastal. So surprise, now that Coastal understands it, Coastal's doing exactly what everyone understood it would have done had this been presented. You know, they say it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. You need to ask permission. But anyway, those are my comments. Um, I, I feel for everyone who's who's in this pipeline, who's got a problem. When I say that, though, I, I mean the people who lost their homes, uh, not not people who. And, oh, and one last thing. This does not mean that people cannot build whatever they're lawfully entitled to build on a property. It just means they have to get a coastal development permit. That's all it means. It does not mean it can't be done. A lot of people have talked about not being allowed to do things now. That is not true. All that's necessary is to follow the law, get the proper permits, go forward. So I'm sure we're going to be having a meeting to discuss this in greater length, but it's nowhere near as clear cut and cut and dry as people are making it out to be. Thank, Thank you, Bruce. You. Okay, I'm going to do my report, which will be a little bit longer than it usually is for me, unfortunately. Uh, I'm very uh, interested in going forward with the School Safety Partnership. Uh, glad to have been part of it. I actually been talking to people from the PTA for the last 12 months about it. Uh, I was grateful that I had the opportunity to attend the Webster Junior High and High School promotion ceremonies. Very sorry that, uh, that Point Doom Elementary was on top of Webster. So it's very difficult to be in two places at once, so I, I wasn't. I'm very encouraged always when I see our young people uh, playing music, uh, having their accomplishments uh, talked about at graduation. Uh, it's a great community we're in, and I really, really want to continue Malibu's path towards making our schools the best in the nation. Uh, I was on uh, two outreach Zooms, one for the Cook Conservancy and the other for the MRCA. Each of them lasted over two hours. And basically what they were doing was telling us that they have tons of money and what do they want to do? What, what do we think, the public think they ought to do about it? And I, th I found that they were very receptive to the input I was giving them and other people was giving them and basically, uh, we're looking forward to working productively with them in the future. Uh, the Public Safety Expo, I was delighted to participate in that, wearing my CERT uniform and, uh, and talking to people. And uh, that location we have, we've had these, this last two in is not as enthusiastically embraced as when we had them at uh, Vintage Market out there at Trancas, that was probably the high water mark for that. It really seemed like a party and maybe we'll be able to return at some future point. I did enjoy the city selection committee and I'm delighted to hear that, uh, that uh, the dam removal is something that is uh, being looked into by the State parks, I'm sure that they will come up with something that is more uh, sensitive to the environment than the Co Army Corps of Engineers plan to send thousands of trucks to the bottom of the creek and take everything from the bottom of the creek out to the, uh, out to the landfills. And there's a better way to do it, the better way that was discussed in front of the uh, in front of the Army Corps of Engineers was to trim it down a few feet at a time over a course of many years and let the force of the water distribute the sand and, uh, and, and dirt 
make its way to the ocean where it can become our sand. Uh, as far as people keep talking about less than the 82 finished homes we have, um, and that does not include the, the uh, condominiums that are underdone, but right now there are 344 sets of plans that have been approved by planning. Of those, 234 had permits issued. And of the 234, 82 were finished. So there's still 152 active permits out there that our people have to go out and inspect. Uh, and our inspectors are working very hard and I can't be appreciative enough about them. And, and there are still 110 in line at planning. Now that still leaves out of the 478 or 470 that burned, that leaves 130 that haven't done much of anything. And, uh, you know, I know that staff has been trying to contact those people, trying to see if there's anything we can do to help them. They're trying their hardest to make it happen. As far as the option four, the, the uh, most horrible case I've heard about option four is I know of a gentleman whose house burned. He's been through three sets of plans because people went sideways on him. He now has a set of plans that's what he had before, plus 10%, plus 42 feet. And for that 42 feet, he's now stopped. That makes no sense. I've also been at a lot of council meetings over the years where people read a letter from Coastal telling us, you have your plan, start administering it yourself. And I think that the actions that were taken by the previous council when they decided to make option four possible to stop what would happen if everybody builds their, what they had before plus 10%, and then go back in to get permits for another bedroom. Your neighborhood doesn't want that. I don't want that. I live within earshot of three rebuilds right now, and I can hear them every morning. I want them to finish as soon as possible. I don't think that that's an unusual sentiment. I think the citizens of Malibu want the rebuilds to proceed as quickly as possible. And I think that's about it for me. So thank you very much. And I believe that will take us now to the consent calendar. Have any items been pulled from the consent calendar? Yes, eight items have been pulled by the public. What are those, please? They are 3A1, 3A2, 3B4, 3B6, 3B9, 3B12, 3B14, and 3B16. It was 3B14 and 3B16? Correct. Okay. Looks like somebody doesn't like even numbers. Okay, uh, are any members of, have, are any members, of, would any members of the council like to pull one of these? Any of these? Okay. I'll, I'll okay. make a motion to approve the consent calendar except for 3A1, 3A2, 3A, I'm sorry, 3B4, 3B6, 3B9, 3B12, 3B14, and 3B16. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve the amended list of uh, items on the consent calendar. Are you ready for the roll call? I'm ready for the roll call. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uri? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, who do we have to speak to item 3A1? Mayor, I did want to suggest when the council originally heard the projects that are now 3A1 and 3A2, you did hear them concurrently. If you'd like to do that again, we do have most of the same speakers signed up for both of those items. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so there are seven speakers total. The first few are David Rosen, John Alfano, Heather Alfano, and James, uh, James George. And David Rosen will be our first speaker. Thank you, David. Are you David. available? I am here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor and, and, and uh, Council Members. I, uh, and uh, it's already been a long evening for you, so I'm not going to say much. Uh, I represent uh, Lloyd Stateman, who owns the property directly above uh, this project. And um, we, we've read the, the resolution and, and just want to say that we, we very much support and very much appreciate the resolution and, and hope that, uh, that the Council adopts it. Okay, and would that be uh, applicable to both of the resolutions? That's to both, exactly, to both the resolutions. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we have John Alfano, followed by Heather Alfano and James George. John, are you available? Mr. Alfano, are you available? I'm not getting a response from him, so we can try to hear from Heather next. I see Heather's hand. Heather, are you available? Can someone unmute her, please? Heather, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute, or John. It's possible they've stepped away, so let me see who our next speaker could be. Uh, we should be able to hear from James George next. James George, are you available? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And thank you for uh, letting me speak. Um, uh, much like David Rosen, uh, we covered many significant issues uh, in the last uh, in-person meeting on these two projects, uh, and I support the resolution as written, uh, resulting in its what we believe is its rightful denial. And I was actually going to cede some time to David if he had anything more to say, if there were any more discussions or debate about this issue other than just affirming uh, what was proposed. That's all I have. Thank you very much. And Mayor, our next few speakers were Tyler Crest, Charles Hagen, and John Henning. I'm not seeing, oh, we have John Henning in the meeting. I'm sorry, one moment. Mr. Henning, are you available? Yes, I am. Shall I start? Yes, please. Uh, good evening, council members. I'm just uh, echoing the statements of a couple of the other speakers, which is that uh, my client, which is 33340 PCH LLC, which is the owner of property about 500 feet away, we're in full support of the staff recommendations and the proposed resolutions. And if you have any questions that I can answer, I'd be more than happy to do it. Thank you very much. And I think we can give the Alfanos one more try, and I'll just make sure none of the other speakers have shown up in the meeting either. Thank you. Heather and John, you should both see pop-ups asking you to unmute. I'm not getting a response from either Heather or John, and I don't see any other speakers in the meeting. So that concludes public comment for 3A1 and 3A2. Do we have a motion, oh, Bruce? Yeah, um, you know, we, we got a multi-page single space letter from council for the applicants at the last moment this evening. Um, they, they know how to write sooner. And, but, but they raised a whole bunch of technical issues. And I would like to propose, I'd like to move that we table this until the next meeting. We fly spec the motion, the resolutions to make sure they, they respond to every issue that the lawyers have raised because they've threatened litigation. We wanna make sure we get this absolutely right. Uh, and then we bring this back for approval. Can I ask uh, Mikey? Uh, uh, Mr. Cotty, did you see the email and do you have uh, any comments on it? I've not had a chance to go through the, the, the email that came in. As, as Mayor Pro Tem Silver says, that late in the night. Or right before the meeting, so no, I didn't have a chance to go through it. It was, yeah, I only got to buzz read it. It was fairly litigi litigious, I would say, would be my quick take. Um, that's all. Karen? 
Yeah, I agree. It came in late and a lot of stuff was coming in late today. Um, it, it, too much to absorb uh, that late in the day. I agree with Bruce. Uh, this seems like a team that could have uh, sent something to us sooner. Um, I'm questioning if it's if it makes sense to continue it. And maybe I would ask for uh, City Attorney Cotty to comment on that. Although I I understand you haven't read it. Yeah, I, I, again, it's a six page letter that came in late this afternoon. Again, I have not gone through it in great detail. I'm looking at it now. Um, it raises a lot of the same concerns that were presented to you before. Um, Namely, that there are no alternative project designs in this, and because there are no project designs, this results in the taking. Um, I, I'd be happy to, to go through this letter and provide a detailed summary of its contents to the council prior to the next meeting. Okay. Happy to do that. And having heard that, I'd like to second Bruce's motion. Any more? Discussion, Bruce? Yeah, I'll just say that the, I, delaying this for two more weeks or whatever it is isn't going to provide any benefit to the applicant. They, they, they can't build without a permit, so their permit's been denied. This is just a question of what the resolution is going to say. So that's, that's the only reason I'm suggesting we table it, make sure we dot our I's and cross our T's and do everything absolutely right so that when they do go to court, um, they'll be in the worst position that they can be. And we'll be okay. in the best. All right, Kelsey, would you like to call the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Councilmember Uring, you're muted. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. That brings us to 3B4. Who do we have, uh, who pulled it and what can we do for them? We have one speaker for this item. It is Scott Dietrich, and we can hear from him now. Hi, Scott. <laughs> Thank you again, Mayor. Um, you know, we've seen tonight how long it takes in these virtual meetings to go through public comment when there's a number of them. We got to get people to unmute. They're not available. We come back to them. I, and, and, I'd like you all to remember the last in-person meeting that we just had a couple of weeks ago. People could choose to sit far away from others. I'd love to go back to in-person meetings. So I urge you have a hybrid meeting if somebody wants, but we, we should try to go back to um, in-person meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And that concludes public comment for this item. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve this item. There's a lot of COVID in my neighborhood, so not really. And I take care of people that are in their 90s, so there's that little issue I don't want to bring on them. So I understand a what second. you're saying, Scott. Don't we have a motion and a second to approve item 3B4. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. We have someone pulled item 3B6. Can they tell us what their concern is, please? Yes. Ryan pulled this item. He is our only speaker, and we can hear from him now. Mr. Embry, how can we be of assistance? Okay, so um, th this is the uh, a CWE, which is the three letters you put on the agenda for this big contract for a lot of money. Um, the project is the design and so forth of storm drain improvement and capacity increase public infrastructure project for stormwater drainage in a specific area. And I think this one's Malibu Park, if I'm if I am correct. But previously, Los Angeles County Flood Control 
would have handled this type of project. Now, the only thing is, I think the county collects funding to build this kind of stuff and inspect it and maintain it and clean it out, uh, repair it, rebuild it when the time comes or enlarge it if necessary by increasing the, uh, the size of the swale or the size of the pipes and so forth. And the city doesn't seem to have a cost recovery a mechanism proposed here. So I took it on the opportunity to speak this evening is for the benefit of the residents who live up there, who need this facility, it needs to be state of the art and it needs to be inspected and maintained and cleaned out and monitored professionally. Now there's other districts in Malibu that have facilities unique or upgrades and in the instance after the 96 fire, perhaps by the 93 fire, for instance, the La Costa neighborhood decided amongst themselves that they were gonna upsize, oversize their water main in the streets and not gonna suffer the types of issues and problems that they uh, experienced during the fire. And similarly, in the Big Rock neighborhood, they have a district that monitors and and repairs and operates the dewatering system that keeps their neighborhood safe. And so why is it that the Malibu Park area residents don't have the benefit of a similar funding mechanism that's gonna make sure that they have a state-of-the-art stormwater drainage system that's gonna be kept up and maintained. And then the flip side to this is why should all the residents of Malibu be funding this and, and subsidizing it when they're not benefited because Malibu is over 20 miles long and the needs for special services and districts varies by, na by neighborhood. And the city has a cost recovery requirement in the council policies for when it does things and services and this should uh, come up on an agenda on how to fund this and maintain it in the future. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, on the first page of the agenda item, it says that the project is funded by a FEMA hazard mitigation grant program. There is sufficient funding available for this agreement. This is a replacement for something that was built originally by the county or maybe by the developer of the neighborhood, but it seems that we've already uh, lined up a funding source for this. Karen, sorry. Yeah, um, thanks, Paul. I Basically, I was just gonna ask Rob if he had anything to add to that. I, I think Paul did a good job. I mean, it, it's, uh, um, yes, uh, right after the Woosley fire, we had substantial amount of debris and, um, mud coming down Malibu Park area and specifically down um, Clover Heights. Uh, and there's a big storm drain there out that goes through mud debris going everywhere down Clover Heights. As you can, um, many of, of, of us know down here, the mud down the end of the cul-de-sac got piled up. And so after the Wesley fire, we met and discussed kind of mitigation measures we could, we could apply for with FEMA and, and Cal OES. This is one of those projects that will alleviate that storm drain issue at the corner of Harvester and Clover Heights, um, bring that storm water down, down the street in a closed conduit and uh, reduce the flooding to those neighbors and property owners and specifically flooding the streets, which was a very big issue. So um, that's, uh, uh, that's this project and it, it is funded by uh, a FEMA hazard, hazard mitigation grant. Thank you very much. I'll make a motion to approve. A second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 3B6. Will you take the roll, please? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. It brings us to only the second odd number. Number 3B9, uh, who is gonna to talk to us about the biofiltration repair project? 
We have one speaker for this item, Bill Sampson, and we can hear from him now. Hi, Bill, are you available? Yes. We, we hear you. Good, okay. So um, since 1980, my, my wife and I, suffering incredible privation and uh, have survived in a 1,566 square foot house with a daughter, exchange students and others. And to help us do that, we've walked down Broad Beach Road almost every day for those last 42 years. As Mr. Silverstein suggested earlier tonight, and as an old Tork professor of my mind said, the road to hell is paved with the bricks of good intentions. There are brick pavers there in this biofiltration project. They were installed over an incredible lengthy period of time. So we walked down Broad Beach Road and had to stay out of there and we have cheated death successfully. The concept is great. I don't have a problem with it. The problem is the installation was either badly designed or badly performed. I have a faint understanding of general relativity, a good understanding of special relativity. I understand a lot of quantum mechanics. I got through a course in fluid mechanics. I've lived near the water almost all of my adult life. I have never watched water flow uphill. The project is presently constituted. Giant puddles form at the bottom of the hill just past the public entrance on the flat part of Broad Beach Road. Every time it rains, every time, mud flows in there. The bio, and the reason is that the biofiltration system, excuse me, system is lower than the drain there. Uh, that, it would seem that this ought to correct that. There are a couple of other places where there are large puddles because drains are higher than the puddles created on this uh, filtration system, which serves basically as, as a sidewalk on the land side. I, you've probably seen it. Um, another place at 308, across the street from 30866 Broad Beach Road, there is a, another puddle where the puddle butts up against rocks that were placed against the slope between Broad Beach Road and PCH. Um, and that puddle cannot possibly reach the drain unless water starts violating several of the laws of thermodynamics. It ain't gonna happen. I hope that this project will fix those insufficiencies. I can't tell you if it's design or what have you. I did notice that the contractor uh, uh, JTEC Corporation, the people with, that you're going to sign a contract with, are not listed on the state, uh, California Secretary of State's website as being a corporation in good standing, nor ever having been one. There was one back in 71. They're not listed as a foreign corporation there either. I assume Mr. Cotty Bill, can do the homework on that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That concludes public comments. Okay. Mr. Cotty, uh, who, who, how do we find out if we're dealing with someone who is a licensed contractor? I don't know if, uh, Mayor Versanti, if Mr. Sampson was saying that they're not a licensed contractor. I think what he was saying is they're not in good standing on the Secretary of State's website, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm looking right now. Perhaps Mr. DeBow can uh, enlighten us. Well, in order for us to um, qualify them as a responsive and responsible bidder, uh, um, they have to have a contractor's license through the state of California. Uh, we did look at that as part of our process of reviewing bids and their bid documents. We found that the contractor does have a valid contractor's license, and, and, and therefore we deemed them um, in compliance with the bidding documents. And perhaps I mis misheard Mr. Sampson. I apologize. I think I think Mr. Debeau actually did some research, and <laughs> and uh, the research that was done by someone else was not as thorough. So 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 let me kind of just just real quick. Uh, um, this project is actually a response to storms subsequent to the Woolsey fire. Uh, uh, yes, there was mud debris that went down 
uh, Broad Beach Road, filled up our biofilters, which are out there on Broad Beach Road um, that are meant to um, for us to be in compliance with our MS4 permit. It's also in compliance to a settlement agreement we had with the Baykeepers. This project is merely going through with those pre-fabricated pre, uh, biofilters, replacing the media, put, put in, putting new media in, so those biofilters are working. Um, I'll be happy to get with uh, Bill, and, and maybe we can kind of touch base and either walk that area. You can kind of show me the areas. I, I know the, the, the area you're talking about, about the rock. Uh, um, a lot of those rocks were put down there to um, to prevent public and, tra and traffic and cars from actually running over the biofilters, and maybe one of those got knocked off and pushed over and now blocking it. So I'll be happy to reach out with you. Maybe we can kind of look to see what we can do to correct some of those problems. Perfect. Do we have a motion to approve this? I so move. Approve RL second. A motion and a second to approve item number 3B9. And I think we were also instructing Mr. Sampson to talk to Mr. Mr. DeVoe. Okay. I think we're instructing Mr. DeVoe to talk to Mr. Sampson. Uh, and I think that uh, <laughs> Mr. Sampson's point was that they, that they are a suspended entity on the Secretary of State's website. We can look into that and follow up as well. Okay. All right. So, Kelsey, can we have a vote? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Proton Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item 3B12. Back to the even numbers. Yes, we have one speaker for this. We have Ryan for this item and we can hear from him now. Hi, Ryan. Yeah, so this is a proposal for FM research to do some polling, I guess, of um, the concept of increase or levying a um, sales tax that all of Malibu residents would have to pay when they buy something other than food, uh, unless it's restaurant food or hot food or takeout food from a restaurant in Malibu, that we would all have to pay 365 days a year increased sales tax. And this is because you as a council decided you wanted to move forward with exploring this concept. Now, FM three research um, could also run a public relations campaign if uh, they give you the right answer and you want to move forward with taxing the residents a higher you know gasoline and everything else we'd have to pay this extra sales tax on and it would just make people want to fill up their car tanks you know in Calabasas or some other place that doesn't have this extra fee and the price of gas is cheaper anyway so Gasoline and restaurant sales are the highest sales tax generators in Malibu and probably always will be. And the amount of money here is not a whole lot of money. And you may think it is, but it's all coming from Malibu taxpayers for the whole year. And yeah, you'd rope in the tourists when they come and I don't know, buy some candy at, at CVS or something that's taxable you'd be getting tourists to pay it. But the proposal that Karen brought up earlier, which was, hey, she had no problem with Malibu being up there at the top of the list for a transient occupancy tax. Somebody has to be at the top of the list. And I guess um, we could join that other city that's 18% uh, or whatever the maximum is. That's the way you get revenue. And that's the way you get it from tourists, and you don't penalize the people of Malibu with a higher prop or higher sales tax all year long. So my suggestion is don't uh, go out and try to get the answer you want with a survey. And then certainly you should not use the same company if you do go ahead tonight to go do a PR campaign to try and make a citizen vote turn out that way in Malibu that this was all gonna be mostly paid by tourists and so forth. So that's my comments. I, I suggest that you, you not do that and go back and present increase of 
the parking tax, which you did not put on the ballot last time, and make that 15% uh, for the Zuma lot, for instance, and the city would then get that increase in value um, instead. And you are not considering that as prominently. Ryan, that's your time. Karen, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Ruthie something. Ruthie, if you don't mind. Hi, I'm trying to go from memory on that staff report. Didn't it say that something like 70% uh, of this type of tax was paid by visitors? Yes, and, and Ms. Shalverson is, uh, uh, Shavelson is also on the line, but the, um, on the call, 73%, 72 or 73% um, is paid from out of town uh, activity. And there was a very detailed analysis with uh, an explanation of the uh, factors that were taken into consideration in order to derive that number. Okay, the, uh, that's my only question, unless uh, Elizabeth Shavelson has anything to add. Uh, no, that, that pretty much covered um, the analysis of 73% um, found to be paid for by non-residents. Okay, thank you. That's, those are my only questions. Thank you. Any other comments? We have a motion. I'll make a motion to approve um, 3B12. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve items 3B12. Can you take the roll, please? please. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item 3B14, which is the agreement with Solid Waste Solutions, which does our film permitting. And we have one speaker on this item as well. It's Ryan, so we can hear from him now. Mr. Embry. Thank you. I wanted to say that um, this has been going on for what 20 years now i can remember when pam ulick was on city council and she says look at this look where all the money goes um it this contract uh ingratiates the uh paper processing contractor at 75 percent as a percentage of the take of the permit fee uh, I think you need to do a little bit of head scratching and um, analysis as to the amount of work and number of hours it takes to do this um, and see if that is appropriate. Now, apparently the, um, the RFP was maybe not cast as wide or solicited actively as it should have been. And uh, what you got only the same bidder, the, the company that's had the contract for 20 years. I'm a little disturbed by the 75%. The other cities that are listed as being served by the contractor may have a different percentage or a lower percentage, and that was not investigated or disclosed in the report. And the city could also consider doing this with hired staff in-house and keeping the 75%. And what was difficult to determine other than looking at the budget is that this what, brings in a million dollars a year and you're, you're letting 75% go stay outside the city. Um, I'd like to hear the staff explain that, the, uh, what the amount of fees that are charged, what amount are kept and retained for the city budget and somehow I try to explain a 75% uh, retention rate to the contractor for doing paperwork. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Bruce? Yeah, I, I remember asking about this one the first time it came around after I was elected and saying, you know, okay, I'll go, I'll go along with it this year, but we should learn more about it next year. And here we are next year and haven't learned any more about it. So far as I can tell, um, this may be perfectly appropriate or it may be 
a gift pretty much of 25 to 50% or more of um, what we make from this. So I think Ryan raises some good questions and if we don't need to approve this tonight, I would like to see it um, rejected for now and, and get more information. I, I have a question for staff. Uh, it says that they provide the same services for Agoura Hills, City of Calabasas and City of Goleta. Since they are a city like us that has to publicly disclose their contracts, has anybody gone and done a dive into the uh, the records for any of those cities about their existing contracts with this this uh, company? Um, good evening again. This is uh, Ms. Kinto. Hi. No, I have not done a, a dive regarding comparable cities, but um, to answer. Council Member Silverstein's question directly. The contract does expire on June the 30th. Um, we had the best intentions to issue an RFP in time to have responses evaluated appropriately, make a recommendation to the City Council um, before the expiration. However, um, that was um, not completed. And so we are requesting this extension so that, specifically so that we can do an RFP and at that time would uh, absolutely uh, dive deep into an analysis regarding comparable um, rates when proposals are received. How long is this extension, please? This extension is for five months, correct, Liz? Yeah, till November 30th. Okay. To allow time for the RFP process. And failing signing this, the existing contract ends uh, the end of June or July the 8th, actually. No, the end of June. No, July the 8th, 2022, which is... Uh, about 26 days from now. Bruce? Yeah, two comments. I mean, if we need to extend it, I'll, I'll, I'll go along with that. But um, one, an RFP may not be enough because I think the other option is, should we be doing this in-house? What will it cost us to do it? Can we do it? And the other comment is, I don't know that the cities on the other side of the hill are necessarily comparable. We're a destination for filming much more than they are. So um, it may be that there's a lot more work to be gotten here more easily. And because of that, less needs to be paid by way of commission. Okay. Well, it sounds, like, it sounds like we should do the extension, get some more information then you know, come back and talk about it again. It sounds like that's what I'm hearing. So I would make a motion to approve the extension. I'll second. Although Steve, I see I saw Steve's your hand. hand. I was going to make the same comment Mikey just made. I think what we're going to do is get the extension. Let's go out and do some research. We can figure out what everybody else is paying and, and see if there's any other firm out there that can do this for us. And hopefully also take a look at what it costs to do it in-house. So we got a little bit of time. we got till November to do that. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Is this just a matter of processing applications, or does this firm go out and solicit the work and 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 you know bring bring in the filming work? Bruce, I've had some contact with these folks because they did some filming and stuff here for Harbor Viz. They do. They they process the paperwork. They also have people to go out to the sites to make sure that whatever the rules were that the filming company was supposed to be using were actually being instituted. At least that's what I, that's my understanding of part of their role. Right, no, I'm asking, are they responsible for getting the work that pays the bill? So listening, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would I would offer if if you'd like an answer to that question specifically, we do have um, Kimberly Nelson on the line. She's here on the Zoom call. She could answer that more specifically. But in my very limited experience with this operation, I will say there is a lot more work involved than I would have ever thought, and um, it really matters. It, it results in the matter of implementing the ordinance that the city has in place, which has multiple requirements, um, including the number of days that can uh, properties can be used and um, and bonding requirements and other monitors as um, Councilmember Uring just mentioned, but uh, Kimberly is on 
the call if you'd like for her to answer that specific question about promotion. I think that would be great. Kimberly, can you join us? I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Fantastic. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Kimberly Nilsson. I own Solid Waste Solutions. We are a consulting firm that does engineering work and also film permitting work for cities. We provide service to you for film permitting. We implement the rules and regulations of the city. We do not solicit for the work. We issue permits just like Rob Dubow's people issue encroachment permits. So we institute the safety measures, the monitoring measures. We provide the neighborhood notifications. My staff is in the field almost every day. And we also make sure that we are implementing all permits in accordance with the Malibu Municipal Code. We get a percentage of the fees. The city by law can't make a profit on permit fees. And the city manager back in the day decided that he wanted the fees to be done as a percentage of fees, just like the plan checks are done by consultants on a percentage of the fees. So that's where that came from. Um, it was done quite a while ago. We've been around for a long time. I am an engineer, so traffic safety is one of my key issues, and all my people know that. So it is a lot more complicated than just issuing a paper permit. We are your field representative. We are available to you on the weekends and in the evenings, and we can do between 500 and 800 permits a year. So Council Member Silverstein is correct. The only other agency that does the magnitude of permits that we do would be like the City of Santa Clarita and Film LA. And if you have any questions, I can answer your questions. Thank you for joining us, Kimberly. Thanks, Kimberly. That was helpful information. I appreciate it. Okay. I believe we have a motion and a second. Can we call the roll? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Proton Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. I'm looking for item uh, 3B16, and I must have misplaced it because, oh wait, there it is. Okay. Uh, who would like to talk to us about 3B16? We have two speakers for this item. They are Scott Dietrich and Ryan. We'll hear from Scott Dietrich first. Uh, Scott. Hello again. Um, as a public works commissioner, it's come to our attention that certain projects seem to slip by pretty much everybody. I could point out to the tower, the light that uh, was negotiated that uh, for Nobu. Um, but I've heard a number of times from people uh, the commissioners on uh, the planning commission that they would like to hear from <clears throat> either us on public works or from our friends in public safety, but they're not allowed to do that. And, and that doesn't seem right. I don't know what the log jam is, but I, I hope you can do something about that. Um, we at public works, meet fairly regularly with the folks at Public Safety, and we enjoy working together uh, to come up with solutions. Um, so I think the more that the commissions can work together to provide recommendations to council, the better we get, the more we get city input from citizens, and uh, the, the better we can do our job for you guys. So I would, I'd like if you can set it up so that if the Planning Commission needs to talk to any of us, uh, they, they can communicate. I don't know why they're not allowed to, but it seems like they're not. Secondly, Public Works Commission, of course, deals with projects under Director Rob DeVoe. 
that are city projects. But any big project should run through our commissions, whether it's public works, whether it's public safety, there's often components. So um, I, I think that that will allow for more public input and uh, which is, is what we want because there's been several projects lately, Westward Beach Road and then the big tower of Babel over there that have come to almost a final vote or come to the council and then the council has to send it back to us. And uh, because somehow people didn't know about it. So the more public input we can get, I think the better job we can do. And uh, so I hope you guys would address those issues. Thank you. Thank you. I and see Lance has also joined us from Public Works. Would you like to hear from him next? Sure, why not? <clears throat> How are you doing, Lance? Hi, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, as it, Also, as a uh, Public Works Commissioner, um, I would like to um, second what Scott was saying as far as input on issues. Uh, we've worked very well with the Public Safety Commission. We'll work with all the commissions uh, whenever they uh, require it. Unfortunately, at our last Public Works meeting, however, under the guise of um, some, some of the commissioners, uh, they thought that that maybe uh, we needed to add to our assignments issues which weren't necessarily under the purview of the uh, Public Works Commission. And um, I just want to make absolutely sure that what we're not doing here is uh, snagging an issue from, or trying to snag an issue from another commission. Uh, we'll work together with anyone. I mean, I, I think that that's actually the way to proceed on a lot of issues. But um, I, I have some some serious reservations about us uh, trying to take over an issue that supposedly was not brought before our commission. And the reason it wasn't brought before our commission was because it's not within our purview. So um, I just, with that caveat, I, I just want to wanted to weigh in on what Scott's talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Our okay. next speaker is Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Are you available? Uh, yes, I wanted to uh, thank Lance for the introduction because uh, he's aware of um, the conflict that the. Uh, the issues when you, when someone says roads, well, you know, Paul, you were on public works commission. Uh, when we're talking about the uh, traffic engineering and design of transportation systems and whether, I'll give you an example, that uh, there was a, uh, a request to make Heathercliff Road a four lane road um, back in the 90s. And the city even hired a traffic engineer to stripe it out. And it would have been a total disaster. And you know what? Nobody's complained in the meantime that we made just two big wide lanes so everybody could turn in and turn out without crossing over the center line or into any other lane. So sometimes the simpler solution is better. Now, what's very clear is the city had three or four different uh, appointed groups. There was emergency preparedness task force and study group. Uh, well, the change's name over time, we had transportation. We've also had public works. But when the city went to create commissions, it um, tried to give public works a few extra things to do because the transportation was taken in um, with public safety along with emergency preparedness. That was two committees. And so the established dial ride program ended up in public works so they could monitor that and take a little bit of the load off. Well, in the interim time, uh, a lot of the commissioners probably don't review what their duties are under the municipal code, but when the city rearranged some of these duties, the specifics of traffic engineering was placed in public safety because not that it's public safety, it used to be called the transportation group. 
And so that's where it belongs. The public works projects like the storm drain project in, in Malibu Park or resurfacing a road as is, as was, those are capital projects. The interval and the maintenance and funding and so forth is the purview for capital projects monitoring by public works commissioners. But when we're talking about traffic engineering, that's another matter. And usually, uh, as referenced in the code itself, traffic engineering is that duty of the Public Safety Commission. So you have tonight, however, the confusion because the Public Works Department staff members administer to both components here. And I think it's items 11 and 12. Uh, sorry, I have so many windows open. But items five of Public Works, which is review parking issues citywide, that's, you know, striping the road. That's a transportation issue. And number 11, work with Caltrans on redesigning Pacific Coast Highway. Ryan, it doesn't say that's your time. And Mayor, that concludes public comment. Thank you so much, Kelsey. All right. Uh, I think it's from my time on public works, I can definitely remember many times that public works and public safety work together because safety and actually building the item that was designed are, are dependent on each other. And I, I don't, uh, I never felt that there was a problem with that. I also can't remember any time when anyone was prevented from attending a public works meeting. And I certainly am aware that nobody I know has been pre uh, prevented from attending a planning commission meeting. So I, I don't know how, uh, how Scott is being prevented from talking to those people about what they do and, and vice versa. But I would like very much to go ahead and pass item 3B16. Would anyone like to make that motion? I'll make that motion. Second. We got a motion and a second to put forward item number 3B16. Council, will you take the roll? Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member, Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. It is currently nine o'clock. Uh, we're about to start item 4A, which will probably take a little while. I would like to see us take a uh, Well, can we meet back here at 925? Agreed? So you get you get seven minutes, maybe eight. Can you turn off your cameras and microphones, please?
while you're muted. For some reason, I managed to get a nice big uh, thing on in front of me with my time on it. Okay, so that brings us to item 4A, which is the proposed budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Do we have a staff report? We do. Good evening, Mayor Grisanti and council members. It is our pleasure to present again, but this time for council's action, the fiscal year 2022-23 proposed adopted budget and annual work planned, as well as resolutions for the appropriations limit, authorized positions, salaries, and new job descriptions. Next slide, please. We will briefly cover the items listed here, starting with an overview, working through the budget development process, and a summary of certain revenues, trends, expenditures, et cetera. Most importantly, we, I am joined by my colleagues and my uh, department heads will, our department heads will overview their uh, reorganizations, which are a vital part of um, the proposed budget for your consideration this evening. In a few slides, I'll start handing them over, handing the presentation over to the departments. Um, but um, at this time, I would like to offer for the city manager to make a few comments if he wishes. And next slide, please. Well, thank you, Ruthie. Um, and I appreciate the moment. And I would like to thank the mayor and the council for their support and their feedback throughout this process. I'd also like to thank our interim assistant city manager, Ruthie Quinto. Uh, and our budget manager, Renee Nierman, and all of the uh, department heads for their work on putting this together. Uh, I just want to say to the mayor and council uh, that this uh, budget uh, is a response to hopefully us listening to you and listening to what the community is asking for uh, and giving you that response. Uh, so we've already given you quite a bit of detail previously on the budget. Uh, and I know you've heard my comments on the main areas that we're focusing on here, uh, but I'm very happy to uh, present this to you this evening and very confident that the plan that we have presented to you will best achieve the city's aims. I would also like to further reiterate that we have heard you regarding the, uh, re with the proposals for the staffing reorganization. We are going to be watching that very carefully as it progresses both in terms of how it is helping us achieve our mission uh, and just to, and also we will be developing some specific metrics to be able to explain that and show that to the council. Uh, but we heard you very clearly in your previous comments uh, that if we are, uh, if we feel that this is not going far enough uh, or if we need to make some other adjustments, whether that be scaling back or coming back and asking for further assistance, we will not hesitate to do so. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Other than that, I will turn it back over to Ms. Quinto for the remainder of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. This slide illustrates the budget development calendar. We've gone over that in detail, but as you can see, we've had our public discussions multiple times over the past many months. And this evening, um, all those uh, conversations culminate into the recommended action. Next slide, please. Just to go over high level on some numbers that are included, um, what we have before us as published in the materials that were distributed to the council and also posted on our website is uh, pretty much exactly, the, the rounding anyway, is exactly what was presented on May the 23rd. There were very minor adjustments that were made, none material enough even to uh, explain. And in fact, our total revenues may, are maintained at 89.9 million and our total expenditures at 89.8 million. Of course, the general fund making up uh, the lion's share of both of those amounts. And we'll talk about some of those components in just a moment. I do want to just remind the council and um, the public who is joining us this evening um, that we do maintain a, a very prudent financial uh, principle and practice, which is conservative. Um, while we will be investing in growing staffing technology and um, also supporting the city's mission, um, we also take a conservative approach to recognition or uh, estimation of revenues and then also to the increased costs that uh, we may be experiencing for next year. Next slide, please. 
General fund revenues, as was previously reported, remain strong and are driven primarily by property tax, sales tax, and transient occupancy taxes. Together, they represent about 62% of the total general fund revenues. We've talked previously, and I just have to take a moment to mention again, that there are two matters that have the potential to significantly impact the city's ability to remain operationally balanced in the future, starting with the year 20. 324, we have a very significant investment that needs to be uh, deliberated and determined regarding uh, opening the uh, public safety substation included in the Santa Monica Community College campus. Um, additionally, we have a change to our transit occupancy tax ordinance that, uh, if implemented, will reduce those revenues uh, significantly. And I'll talk about that here in just a moment. Slide seven, please. Next slide. This slide illustrates the um, growth over the past 10 years for secured property tax revenues. The average growth for the last three years is about 4.9%. And again, as a conservative budgeting practice, we are projecting the growth for next year to be 3.2%. Next slide, please. This revenue slide is also for the past 10 years, and it illustrates our sales tax revenues. We are estimating that those remain flat from the current year estimates to next year's proposed budget. And while this revenue has returned to pre-pandemic levels, we do recommend a cautious outlook at this time, particularly given the economic indicators um, that include uh, some, some stresses on the not just local and statewide economy, but nationally as well. Slide nine, please, next slide. This slide is uh, transit occupancy taxes for the past 10 years for hotels and motels. Uh, for the current fiscal year, um, we did budget these at about 2.8 million and they are coming in a little better than expected. So we are proposing to increase that estimate for next year. And these resources do uh, reflect the increase in the city's TOT rate from 12% to 15%, and that was approved by the voters in November of 2020. Next slide, please. Transit occupancy taxes from private rentals are depicted here. As you can see, we are being very conservative and um, project those to remain flat as we uh, do expect um, a decrease in these resources due to the implementation of the new ordinance in some manner, um, as will be discussed shortly. And uh, if we do experience a um, economic slowdown, then the losses could deepen even farther than uh, what is estimated if um, a change to the ordinance is, is in fact implemented. Next slide, please. This slide is exactly the same as we have um, described to you over the past several months. Our budget for next year provides for 97 full-time employees and 13.27 uh, part-time full-time equivalents. And we are requesting six additional positions and we'll talk about those in detail in just a moment. The budget also does include the COLA that was estimated at the end of February. We look back at 12 month period um, from one February to the next and we estimate that, uh, or excuse me, the published COLA was 7.4% and that is worked into our budget um, and was also included in the adopted fee schedule uh, upon which council took action in April. Next slide, please. Now we'll start getting into some changes by, for departments and um, overall, again, no changes in any of this uh, information as presented in your materials. And so I won't belabor these changes um, for management and administration, except to say that we are investing in the two areas where we feel there is the greatest need at this time. And that is in uh, information systems and as well in human resources, um, particularly with the turnover in um, staff and, and recruitment and retention efforts um, that go along with that. Uh, next slide, please. This slide depicts a public safety, um, which again has uh, not changed from what we previously presented. It includes our contract with the county as well as the additional contract for the beach team. And the county provided a 1.45% increase for next year. So it's about uh, not quite 100,000 over the current year. And public safety is 21.5% uh, of the city's annual operating budget. And so as that number may increase with the opening of the substation, we certainly will feel its impact. And um, it could add anywhere between three 
four, seven, actually the number uh, could go much higher if we were uh, to implement some um, very large increase in the service level. So um, those conversations are ongoing. And uh, of course, we will be back before council with the options and opportunities, as well as a plan to um, go out to the public and make sure we get that input. Next slide, please. So at this time, I'll, I'll go ahead and toss the presentation over to my colleague, Jesse Bobbitt. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie. Uh, good evening, Mayor Grisanti and members of City Council. I'm happy to present the Community Services Department's portion of the proposed budget for fiscal year 2022-23. Uh, so you can, uh, as you can see here, our budget includes a total increase of just over $400,000, which is primarily related to the continued reopening of department programs and special events, uh, many of which have been on pause or on pause or on modified schedules since the, the pandemic began in, in March of 2020. Some of these programs include our senior center, um, outdoor, rec outdoor recreation programs at Charmley Wilderness Park, our city special events such as charm such as two match day and our halloween carnival and then additional surf camps during spring break and, and summer where we can fit them in uh, one positive note is that while these programs have higher expenditures we also expect to bring in additional revenue with all these programs which have been our revenues have been down over the past uh, year or two because a lot of the programs like i said have been on modified schedules or or postponed or canceled due to the pandemic uh, one item of note that's not in this proposed budget is an additional $55,000, which was requested by the Arts Commission. And the reason that request is not in here is that, um, unfortunately, we're um, pretty overwhelmed with the amount of staff and, and things we have going on that are already on our council work plan. So adding the $55,000, which was to be used for a publicist to work with the commission, an arts and business program, as well as arts center related research, um, is just something that we would need additional staff to, to take over and handle as we're pretty maxed out as it is. So with that additional staff member, uh, the total of that would be about $150,000 annually. And so that's the reason that's not in this proposed budget. Uh, one final note is that what is included in this proposed budget is, proposed, is several improvement projects at Malibu Bluffs Park uh, including upgrades to the Michael Landon Center, which will allow us to accommodate additional workout and dance classes, a redesign of the Majors Field infield irrigation system, which will help us more effectively um, keep the field playable and eliminate the need for costly annual turf replacements, which we do in coordination with Little League, and then the installation of several large decorative boulders at strategic locations to serve as bollards to prevent unauthorized access into the park by cars, uh, whether that be intentional or unintentional. So um, those are the big items and I'm happy to, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the conclusion of this presentation. And for now, I will pass it on to Public Works Director DeBeau. So good evening, Council. And tonight I will present um, my portion of the Public Works budget. Most of it, the budget in here is related to our capital improvement project. But I'll, I'll go over a little bit about some increases that we're having this upcoming year. Overall, we have an increase of, of about 700,000. Um, some of those uh, increases it, it relates to a new assistant civil engineer who will be coming on board and will be filling in and getting some of the work done that we, that we need to uh, um, complete our fire rebuilds, uh, design our capital projects. Um, another increase is a general fund to our capital projects, which is roughly um, seven hundred thousand. Uh, the main majority of our budget it comes in from our capital projects, and we're going to have quite a few of them lined up for this next year. Uh, this next year, we're, we're we're proposing to have sixteen projects in construction that will have a total of thirty three million dollars. Um, we will have four projects that are currently in design. And that, that may transition to construction, depending on the project's uh, schedule. Um, that's roughly $1 million. And we have eight projects that are brand new that will be starting this year with a total of $740,000. The upcoming work plan also includes uh, um, seeking grants and other funding sources for various projects that we're working on. One of them is uh, 
providing uh, funding for the City Hall solar project. We'll provide solar power to our um, City Hall um, and, and other improvement projects that are on PCH. And then lastly, staff is, continues to work with um, the State Water Board and other grant possibilities for additional funding for our Civic Center Water Treatment Facility Phase 2. Uh, we currently have um, a grant consultant under contract to, to help to perform all this work for finding grants and moving forward. Uh, I'm happy to uh, to update and is, is that we're getting ready to submit on some of these uh, grants that are that are going to be that are up and due here pretty soon. And so we're looking forward to getting those applications in and providing council an update. That's all I have for my updates first. I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the presentations. And I think I am turning it over to Yolanda. Good evening, City Council and community that are listening. It is an honor to present the portion of the budget for the environmental sustainability overview for the proposed budget 22-23. Next slide, please. While preparing this budget, it was really important for me to go back and listening to the community, but also to develop a well-balanced workload for the staff so we can be successful at attaining the upcoming goals for council and all the tasks that we have to do this year. A few of the items that are on our workload for this next fiscal year is the uh, building code update changes that are gonna be coming to you this fall. Uh, another state mandate in cleaning water regulations and reporting, RSB 1383, the continuation of that implementation of that program. As, uh, also the electrical vehicle charging ordinance, the dark skies implementation, the coastal vulnerability outreach and a study and the assessment that will be out in, at the beginning of 2023. And in order to provide the services that the community needs, I am proposing the restructuring of the department with as little fiscal impact as necessary to accomplish the work plan while maintaining a strong and cohesive team. Next slide, please. The proposed budget is increased by $800,000 for fiscal year 22-23. This is due to a 500,000 increase in professional services for dark sky implementation for the review and inspection so this program can be successful. The cost of these services will be assessed by generated with the plan check fees. Also, there'll be a $300,000 increase on staffing. I remind the council that during the mid-year budget, the council approved three positions for that, my department. One of them was uh, the environmental analyst, a, an extra counter technician, and also an inspector. Uh, some of those positions are still under recruitment. Um, by the completion of the work plan and the council priorities, we will continue re, uh, focusing on the Woolsey fire recovery on the environmental efforts and to the community engagements providing a high level customer services. Next slide, please. My department is comprised of three uh, different divisions. One of this in field and safety, environmental health, and environmental programs. This slide illustrates to you the numbers, uh, quantitative numbers for the operations, and it shows you the influx of work that has occurred in the past two years and the projections that will be uh, for 2023. As mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, our fire rebuilds is still one of our main priorities and we're making every single uh, family that is coming our priorities. We're doing a 14 day turnaround time when reviewing and we have we, 154 homes under construction. This is generating a lot of inspections in addition to all of the other inspections that we are having to do. We are projecting about 15,000 inspection for next fiscal year. So that as you see, the number of operations and the numbers continue to rise. 
and overall of the of everything that we're doing. And I kind of want to mention and thank the uh, team because this is a team effort. Your environmental sustainability staff is committed to continue providing the services to the community. Um, we continue doing outreach through the environmental programs. Uh, we are also uh, following with grant management. We do web pages uh, monitoring uh, regularly. We do staff reports. And some those are operations that are sometimes we don't speak a lot about it. Next slide. The current Organization of the department, as I mentioned before, my department is divided into three uh, divisions, building and safety, environmental programs, and environmental health, plus the administration portion of it. Currently, I have 17 staff members in three positions that are vacant, and we're going through recruitment. As you see, we are short staff, but we are continuing to push it forward so we can continue providing the best services to the community. Next slide, please. The proposed reorganization for the department will constitute to convert the deputy building official to a senior civil plan check engineer that can assist with plan check reviews. Also, the retitling of a senior building inspector to a supervisory inspector. And also create a principal permit technician out of our one of our senior uh, permit technicians that we currently have. Create a management position to help with the uh, all the implementations on the environmental programs and everything that is coming ahead of us. In order to fulfill our mission and the work plan and also keep the top priorities that council would like us to work on. We are reorganizing and successfully reallocating employees and focusing on our work plan. Next slide, please. This realignment will create a specialized team that will thoroughly understand who and what is needed to keep projects moving forward. There's a lot of tasks it's that the department already is in charge of, like we were briefly mentioning the wastewater uh, uh, projects that we do, the pumper uh, ordinance, the inspections, the installers, the, operation, the operating systems, uh, et cetera. Next slide. In terms of the workflow and the reorganization, we will provide a more fill oversight, a quicker turnaround time, and improve the quality control and the customer services that we are providing. In addition, this reorganization will create a, a better morale for the group and provide growth and mentoring for staffing. And we will continue uh, focusing on our top priorities. Um, such are our, that are set in our work plan. Next slide, please. By successfully reclassifying and reallocating employees, there will be no a need for additional staff. We will concentrate on our fire uh, rebuild priorities, and we will do it with 20 uh, staff members. Uh, so we're not proposing any new uh, um, any new uh, uh, position for this fiscal year. Next slide, please. With this, I will be able to stay more focused and council priorities and also the one-on-one -on -one that our fire rebuild applicants needed just when I came at the beginning and joined the team. Um, I heard this evening and I have been hearing throughout the uh, this month our rebuild uh, families is still at the top of priorities, but we need to make an effort to continue helping them. We are getting so close to the three and a half years of this, and uh, we want to make sure that the community here that we are continue being there for them. Uh, we also want to spend time, especially right now that the city might have a new implementation and a new software permitting system that is gonna take time and it's strategizing. So this will allow me to spend a little more time with that, uh, with that task. Um, overall, I'm very grateful and thankful for the opportunity to continue serving you. I am here um, for any questions you might have. Thank you for the opportunity and I'll uh, 
pass it along to our assistant planning director, Adrian Fernandez, for the planning portion. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Mayor uh, and members of the City Council. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, the next few slides on behalf of the Planning Department in Richard's absence. Uh, Richard's on a uh, well-earned vacation this week. Um, and so, um, um, like I said, I'll be presenting uh, for you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for this budget cycle, uh, we uh, received our practice, uh, we uh, review our practices for the last 15 years. And in doing so, um, we uh, identify issues and needs for the department uh, to improve on past practice. Uh, we would like to introduce, to restructure the department and uh, overhaul our uh, operations. Uh, next slide. Uh, we would like to uh, achieve the council's work plan items uh, while also meeting the demands of our healthy current planning projects. Uh, in summary, uh, we also uh, want to improve other aspects of code enforcement, uh, staff longevity and efficiency. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we hope to accomplish our goals is to uh, restructure the planning uh, department by creating an advanced uh, planning team, two current planning teams and uh, develop and service manager position to improve our operations. Uh, we also hope to reduce uh, caseload, improve technology, use technology for better decisions and improve uh, sta uh, staffing retention. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the current organization chart. Uh, the department is uh, made up of three parts, uh, planning, uh, administration, and code enforcement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have 1,790 total planning projects uh, in various stages. Um, of the uh, total amount, we have four, uh, 544 active projects. Uh, that means that each planner has an average of 57 active projects. Uh, next slide. Uh, this table shows uh, that for the most part, uh, the planning department has uh, consistent intake and out outtake numbers uh, within the last uh, three years. However, it, it shows um, uh, that uh, there has been an uptick in applications received and decisions issued. Uh, and uh, with less staff uh, the last year, uh, this uh, was only possible because of our staff hard work and um, uh, overtime. Uh, next slide, please. The proposed organizational chart includes the same three parts, except that a department service manager will help manage admin staff and planning operations. The planning division would then be divided into three specialties, uh, advanced planning, complex current projects, and uh, short turnaround uh, current projects. Uh, this is to help um, Again, meet with uh, meet uh, city council work plan items, maintain a balance between long range and current planning needs, and to improve productivity and efficiency. Uh, next slide. We're hoping for three new positions in planning: one uh, associate, one assistant, and one intern, uh, and the rec reclassification of an existing position to function as the new administrative manager. Uh, while we would like to add more positions, we uh, want to roll that over the next uh, three years uh, because um, of the learning curve and the fact that um, half our staff um, has been with us for six months or less. Uh, and uh, all those uh, people are, are in entry level uh, position. Uh, next slide. The budget for this year includes uh, adjustments to account for these three new positions. Um, and that's the, the difference between last year and this year. Uh, uh, next slide. 
Uh, in summary, the planning uh, director uh, would like would like to have more time to address council priorities, balance uh, competing needs, uh, reallocate uh, resource to improve planning uh, process, data sharing, and overall customer service. Uh, we would also like to make the necessary uh, investment to keep um, trained staff. Uh, and that concludes the planning part. Uh, now is back to you. Apologize for the delay. The next two slides cover the general fund grant program. As we previously discussed, we received 30 applications totaling over $10 million. Next slide, please. And this slide, as well as the materials um, in your council agenda item, uh, depict the organizations, the 26 organizations um, that are being recommended and were decided on by the um, administration and finance subcommittee for approval. Next slide, please. This slide just shows our general fund reserves over the past 10 years. And notwithstanding the negative impacts of COVID, over the past two years, the city's prudent financial principles and conservative budgeting practices are reflected in the city's strong reserve levels. The general fund balance um, is uh, detailed here on the next slide, pardon me. Um, as illustrated, they include designated and undesignated reserves and the other categories as listed. And we do project for the end of the budget year to have $55.3 million in general fund reserves. In summary, next slide, please. The budget proposes continued investments in the support of the city's mission with an emphasis on staffing technology and the protection of natural resources. And we do maintain strong reserves that support fiscal stability and sustainability as we enter into the next year and some additional challenges that the city may face. And your discussions and deliberations over the past several months, as the city manager mentioned, have been taken into consideration and have culminated in the budget adoption that is scheduled for this evening. And before I hand it back to you, Mayor, I, again, just thank um, my uh, staff in the finance, uh, on the finance team, uh, my deep appreciation to all of my colleagues and especially to the city manager and to you, the council for your leadership. And it has been my pleasure to lead this budget development process over the past six months. And I am fortunate to have had this experience and to serve the city in this manner. And of course, we're all here to answer any questions that you may have, thank you. Thank you so much, Ruthie. Is there, a, I can only see myself, so I'm sure there's, there we are. Would anyone uh, like to lead off? Mayor, oh, you do public. have a few public I'm sorry. speakers, if, unless there are technical questions. Thank you so much, Kelsey. You have four speakers for this item. They are Bill Sampson, Joe Drummond, Scott Dietrich, and Ryan. We'll hear from Bill Sampson first. Thank you. Bill, are you available? I am. I suspect I had signed up for 6A, not 4. Um, I will just say somewhat extemporaneously that the $5 million in transient occupancy tax allegedly to be collected from the motels, including the two on my street of 16, uh, come out of the hides of all of us who have sacrificed our quiet enjoyment. I didn't see any allocation of that in the budget. I suppose that's something that's difficult to quantify, uh, but I had not, I perhaps erred, and for that I'll apologize to all of you because I had not intended to speak on this subject. Thank and you, Bill. Bill, that should actually be my apologies. I'm so oh. sorry, Mayor. I was looking at the wrong list. I was, I was okay. trying to look ahead. You okay. have three speakers for this item now. They are Joe Drummond, Craig Hill, and Georgia Goldfarb. Terrific. Joe, I see that you're uh, up next. Hi there. Thanks. Um, I do hope that planning will immediately implement the plan to solve the backlog occurring with fire rebuilds and other items, not only with the three new planners being one associate planner, one assistant planner, and the two half-time interns. Hopefully, the development services managed will be it. 
we need someone, preferably a seasoned former veteran planning staff member with institutional knowledge, as stated previously by Richard from the city of Malibu, to determine what is a true fire rebuild and what is incremental or serial development of new construction and goes against the mission statement. Ms. Ferrer, the figures we used regarding your property was directly from the city planning department that stated the pre-fire square footage was a certain number and the final permitted number was a certain number, which sure, showed a total a budget discussion. Yeah, this is this is what I'm talking about, which was a certain number, which showed a total of increase of 40%. So if they are making no, that's these mistakes, not a budget comment. No, if they're making these mistakes or not, we need someone to check these projects and get the figures accurate. So Joe, must... you've been doing a pretty good job of checking, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, because you guys aren't, <laughs> because the city planning isn't. That's why. Okay. We're Thank done. you for making up your stories, Joe. Let's so move on. They must help streaming all fire victims and potential residents who are trying to rebuild reasonably. We can possibly start with a one-year contract for this manager or hire this permanent development services manager if they're the ones who can prevent the abuses to the vision and mission statement to be exact. We need to stop the bending of rules to developers' wills, but make codes budget, that are eco-friendly eco fire rebuilds for fire victims. We need this planning manager to manage and allocate the track and track the builds to planners, et cetera, and possibly go over the codes with the staff at regular me me meetings in combination with any changes necessary with Zeracis. I greatly appreciate Richard acknowledging at the special budget meeting that zoning code updated, updates are needed to reduce planning director interpretations so that the staff can implement the will of the city council, especially for fire rebuilds and smaller projects. So this budget hopefully covers the watchdog needed for the planning department to protect regular residents trying to put through small projects and fire rebuilds and scrutinize large developers. The development services manager hopefully can work and communicate expeditiously with the applicants hired consultants like architects and engineers and proactively contact them about requirements to stop the backlog. The planning department needs some relief by a seasoned coordinator right now more than ever. Just in one year, I've discovered three instances where codes are not being followed in the planning department and this needs to be cleaned up and stopped. I'm glad Adrian mentioned at the end of his presentation the need to train and retain knowledgeable staff. It's a great waste of time for the planning director or planner to step in and find out why the workflow someone's permit application is backed up and taking too long. So the development service manager budget taking the place of a senior administrator analyst needs to be immediately implemented. And why did the city offer? Thank you very much, Joe. Okay. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Georgia Goldfarb. Hi, hey, Craig. Mr. Hill, are you available? I am here. I know you guys have a lot on your plate, but this one should be simple and easy. Regarding the municipal code, which already provides for a commission expense stipend, uh, this would be a negligible amount for the city, but would make a big difference for us as the cost of site visits has become significant. We do often hear, thank you for your service, but that doesn't put gas in the tank. Commission does official work for the city, so not to provide this might suggest that the city doesn't fully value our role, especially when staff are getting their well-deserved raises. I don't know why this hasn't been done in the past, but most general law cities do pay the statutory stipend, including the other COG cities, ranging from $50 to $250 per meeting, with Dana Point doing over $1,000 per month. So 100 per meeting is near the low end of that scale and would amount to an annual total of only about 12000 possibly less, as compared with 55 million in the general fund reserves. It's in the code already. You don't need to agendize a separate item. There's no need for a work plan. You can just vote on a specific dollar figure and include it as a minor amendment to the current resolution. If need be, I think the amount is low enough that it would qualify as a discretionary expenditure, not even subject to the budget process, um, meaning that you could include it in the resolution now and leave it to staff to do the accounting as specified in the ordinance. So it's in the code, the city has the money, there's really no reason not to do it. So thank you for your service. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is Georgia Goldfarb. Hi, Georgia, are you available? Georgia, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, First, uh, I have two issues. Uh, first, please compensate planning commissioners at least $100 per meeting plus mileage. Their task is arduous, and considering the increase in cost of gasoline, 
mileage for city business should be covered. It's wrong to ask not only for a very significant donation in time and responsibility, but that they donate expenses for their travel as well. Please compensate them for both. On another matter, that of adequate maintenance of city properties, please allo <laughs> excuse me, please allot adequate funding for that. The city has an obligation to appropriately maintain city properties and fulfill responsible stewardship. Since the city removed the entire uh, native chaparral uh, on certain portions of their property some years ago, at least Heathercliff, Trancus, and an area behind City Hall, invasive plants have taken over and maintenance has not kept a pace. As I previously noted, invasive plants are a not supportive of wildland creatures, which is particularly irresponsible and mean-spirited given the dramatic diminution of wildlife habitat compounded by the risk to wildlife attendant to climate change. B, a significantly increased wildfire risk due to the nature of these plants, which further expands uh, the risk as they spread to wildland habitat and parkland. C, an eyesore and have been associated with dumping of trash found in Trancas fields. One ton was recently removed, plus a refrigerator, <clears throat> excuse me, and D, some are health dangers, such as castor bean, which has ricin in it, and foxtails, which burrow into animals' body and easily fester with infected wounds, as anyone with outdoor pets can attest to. Unfortunately, wildland creatures don't have a vet to take care of them and sometimes suffer uh, pretty miserably from this and may die. Therefore, please provide adequate funding to remove invasive plants on all city properties. We have shown that it can be done, so please provide <clears throat> please provide responsible stewardship for these lands. City property should not be a dump for trash and invasive plants. <clears throat> the city needs to set a good example, not a poor one, of degrading wildland habitat and permitting dumping of trash. So please authorize funding for maintaining <clears throat> our prop gosh, for maintaining our property properties appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. And Mayor, that concludes public comment on this item. Okay. Well, I think we now go to council comments and discussion. I'm sorry, Mayor, we did have one raised hand there right as I was speaking. Would you mind hearing one more speaker? Yeah, I'm sure it wouldn't make any difference, so let's hear them. We'll hear from Ryan next. Now, I submitted to speak on this. Um, when I spoke previously about the maintenance of the storm drain system and the need for a funding mechanism to do that, I, the, the response by you council members was that, that FEMA paid for the design or for the construction of it. But if you were to play back what I said, I was talking about the ongoing maintenance obligations for the whole system and network. And that needs to be budgeted accordingly in here. If you're adding a um, infrastructure asset to the city, which comes with a duty and responsibility to maintain it. So that's the first one. The second is um, I remember David Carmody as a fabulous city manager for our city who said mistakes are expensive. That's why it's so important that, you know, we make the right decisions and in, in regard to that era when we had the 93 disaster and then we had the floods in 95 and another fire in 1996, we used Wildan to do the professional services that a small city needed on a short duration to deal with these problems and uh, not create a, a top heavy staff that, you know, having to fire somebody in a year or two because, you know, the permits were all done and issued and now we don't need the planners and so we fire them all. The idea is that Wildan Associates or Wildan Group, whatever they call themselves now, they, they have a contract with the city and are providing services in some form already that this service needs to be tapped into for uh, providing the services of the planning permits, the tracking, the facilitating, the uh, review, or whatever it takes to get them dealt with. 
The fact that the city council has voted to waive permit fees for a lot of this work should not be penalizing the applicants. Either go back, at, you know, that was not supposed to go on for years and years, but you've done that. If you're trying to uh, slow down the permit process by not paying the extra amount to the outside workers to do the work, that's not fair to the fire victim. You can't have it both ways. So either don't waive the fees anymore or hire outside help to get the job and the work done, as other speakers have said. Lastly, I think it is appropriate for the site visits and the expenses involved with the Planning Commission because their decisions are initially binding by the city that that group, it's long past due that they get a stipend, whether it's $100 or $200 a meeting, uh, it's still a token. But it I really precludes people who would say, no, I'm not gonna do that at all. So we could be turning down talent. So please institute that. Thank you. It's in the Thank code. You. Thank you, Ryan. And Mayor, that concludes public comment. Okay. Once again, I'm gonna to try to call council comments. Everybody's happy and satisfied. No one wants to speak. Can I get a motion to pass the but, uh, item 4A then? I will so move. We got a motion to, to pass uh, the recommendation. Is there a second? I guess I'll make the second. We spent a lot of time on this. It looks like no one wants to, if we're done talking about it. Yes, Bruce. we did discuss it a lot. Yeah. Bruce, I see your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we have discussed this a lot and um, there's not much more to say. The staff's done a great job putting this together, Steve, um, Ruthie, everybody else. Um, on the issue that, that there has been some discussion about, um, not just tonight, but in the past, about remuneration for commissioners, um, you know, I'd gladly give up the $500 a month that we get. We could work for a dollar a month and that could pay for the commissioners to receive instead. So that's something to think about. Um, the only other point I want to make is I, I know it's late and it's been a long night and it's going to continue to be a longer night, but there's no reason to interrupt, denigrate, and marginalize um, our residents when they speak. So I would hope that that would stop. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Will you take the roll, Kelsey? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Green? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. That takes us to item 4B. And this is an engineering and traffic survey. And we are being asked to adopt this survey and establish speed limits. Who will be presenting this? That would be me, Mr. Gasanti. Thank you, Rob. Sure. Can you enlighten us? I, I will do my best. Um, so tonight I, I have uh, I'll present to you the 2022 Engineering and Traffic Survey. Um, it's also known, if you, if you heard it before, the Speed Survey. So if I enter, if I say Speed Survey, that's what this is, means. Next slide. Uh, the speed survey is used to establish and enforce speed limits within the, within the city. Um, the state law requires that the city perform the speed survey every seven years, verify that the posted speed limits are justified for the road conditions. Uh, speed limits are established at or near the 85% uh, percentile speed limit. Speeds are calculated during non-peak hours and to, to determine those, those speed limits. Streets are categorized as residential streets, are automatically set to have a 25 mile an hour speed limit, and no additional speed data is needed for those streets. Next slide. City's traffic consultant performs a speed survey at 46 separate street segments within the city. Uh, the speed survey was conducted on city streets and not on PCH. PCH is controlled and maintained by Caltrans, and they perform that service on PCH. I, I tried to reach out to them, try to get an update on when the last time they performed it, and, and I'm 
still waiting to, to hear back from them. I'll be happy to get that information to the to the council once I've get that. Next slide. Of, of the 46 segments, uh, the speed limits are, are recommended to be lowered in 11 um, segments. And on here, I'll, I'll go over through. I'll go over all of them because it's it, it's pretty exciting news. We get a speed survey that actually uh, goes and reduces speed limits rather than increasing it. And, and it's usually the other way around. The 85th percentile speed limit actually um, shows that the speed limit should increase. And, and so. On here, we have Civic Center Way, Malibu Canyon to Webb Way. Existing is 40 miles an hour. That's going to go down to 35. Dune Drive, Head of Cliff to Cliffside is going to go from 30 to 25. Ensignal Canyon Road, north of the city, uh, north city limits to PCH, 45 to 40. Head of Cliff Road, Wandermere Road to put the Port Dune Club, 30 miles an hour is down to 25. Canyon Doom Road, north of city limits to Galahad Drive. That's currently at 50, and that's going to go down to 45. And also on Canyon Doom Road, Galahad to PCH, 50 down to 45. Malibu Canyon Road, north of city limits to Malibu Knowles, 40 to 45, or 45 to 40. Malibu Canyon Road, Malibu Knowles to PCH, 45 to 40. Merritt Drive, Morning View Drive to Bush Drive. 30 to 25, and Trancas Canyon Road, north of city limits to PCH from 30 to 25. Next slide. Uh, on October 8th, 2021, Governor Newsom signed Assembly Bill 43. This new law gave the cities more control on kind of deciding on how to, spit the, to set the speed limits. Uh, this new law introduced procedures to lower the speed limits uh, independent of the 80th, 85th percentile rule. At, at this time, uh, the city cannot implement sections of AB 43 until the state provides uh, the new guidance and definitions. Um, AB 43 can be used to keep current speed limits if the 80th percentile rule finds the speed limits should increase. And I just want to point out that uh, staff is continuing to monitor the status of AB 43, um, the, the additional uh, definitions and guidelines to see how we can implement uh, um, this, rule, this new rule in place. Uh, um, our consultant and my staff are currently working on a plan to, to implement once this puts, once this puts together uh, from the state, and I'll, I'll be happy to present um, that method going forward once the state has done that. Next slide. In conclusion, uh, staff is recommending the approval of the 2022 engineering and traffic survey that includes the reductions of speed limits in 11 separate street segments. In order to, uh, to revise these speed limits, staff recommends adoption of, of ordinance 500, many of the municipal code setting the speed limits within the city. Um, the proposed ordinance is not subject to CEQA since it, and since it will not result in a direct or foreseeable indirect physical change in the environment. And lastly, if council approves this ordinance, new, new uh, speed limit signs will be placed. The proposed budget for the 2022-2020 fiscal year has funds to actually purchase and install these new uh, signs to put, up, to put up for the new reductions. Uh, I'm, I'm available for questions. I also have our, our traffic consultant here if there's additional questions council has. I believe we now take public comment if we have any public that want to comment. I didn't have any speaker sign ups, but I see one raised hand from Ryan Embry. So he will be your next speaker. I wanted to comment about the doom, I'm sorry, the uh, Canaan doom uh, road proposed speed limit. Um, eh, that's gonna be a contested one. Um, first of all, the uphill from PCH uh, into the mountains, there's no reason to lower that one uh, lower than the 85th percentile or anything close to it, because the stopping distances when you're going uphill 
are much greater. And in that segment, it is only a single lane. It's different than the approach to uh, Pacific Coast Highway, which you know has a right turn and a left turn and and the escape lane and all that other stuff. But there's only one lane going up, and it, it creates a bottleneck there. Um, you get somebody who looks at a sign and, and they actually believe it and they drive like that. You know, you're going to get a whole bunch of people uh, behind them who drive the road every day. And, and basically know what is appropriate for the road. That's, you know, the 85th percentile. So I think that that segment um, should be split and considered separately. And I, I personally, after doing this for 20 something years of reading these surveys for the city, uh, go back and compare it. I've got the surveys for 2014 and 2016 opened on my computer now. And I'm looking at how some of these recommendations are from the same same firm and now they're changing their mind. But anyway, um, the traffic and uses don't seem to change much, but that one in particular is a bit off. And I also wanted to note for the record that uh, Doom Drive has had a lot of political requests to lower that speed limit uh, over and over at every time there's a speed survey. And I think we've done it about as much as it can be justified. Uh, I know maybe that's hard to swallow for, you know, constituents who live on the road, but it's, um, it's a collector road. It's the main drag through the area, a lot of uh, side streets and cul-de-sac streets along it. And I guess if you wanted to live on a little quiet street with no through traffic, you could have bought a house there. Um, that's what I think a, a realtor told Andy Stern one time when he moved to Malibu and bought a house there and then realized the MTA bus drives by every half an hour and work to get rid of the bus, you know. Okay, so I don't want to look backwards. I think that the, um, the speed limit for Doom Drive needs to be very carefully considered because you've put on change speed humps and so forth and cramming down uh, speeds on other streets that are also requesting speed humps. Um, you got to figure out what you're going to do. And But I don't think that the uh, proposed speed change for Doom Drive is going to uh, be enforceable. It may not be sustainable in court, regardless of what the law says for Governor Ralph, Newsom. Ralph, that's your time. Ryan, that's your time. Thank you, Ryan. Is it to the council now? Yes. Okay. Uh, anybody else wants to speak? I'll let him. Bruce. So, a um, couple comments and questions. I'll be I'll be very brief. One is um, Rob. The report says that it's important to note the speed survey does not include PCH as its own maintained and regulated by the state of California. What, if anything, can we do to get that addressed as well? Yeah. So, uh, uh, um, th thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I am close conversations with our, our colleagues over at College Friends and with the specific um, uh, AB 43 that just got passed, they are very looking forward to kind of implementing and, and seeing what kind of reductions we can do on PCH. And, and so we've had some initial discussions. I, I'm going to continue to kind of work in it and see what we can be doing, what Caltrans can be done to, to, to evaluate the speed limits on PCH. And if there's a way we could figure out a way to, to use AB 43 to make PCH safer, and that's what we're going to do. And, and I got confirmation from Caltrans, they are looking forward to do something like that and partner with the city to, to develop something to that nature. That, that would be great. Um, the other question I have is the report states that um, this this reevaluation can be extended up to as much as only every 14 years if certain things are done. Um, Right. Is what do we need to do to not have to go through this again for 14 years as opposed to seven? Anything? You mean do it every seven years or 14? I'm every 14, every 14 instead of every seven. Oof. Um, you know, we really have to see if the engineer will have to make an evaluation to see if there's the site conditions have really changed enough to, to cause um a a reevaluation of a speed limit and so um that could be done it's just it's makes it more enforceable if you do the speed surveys 
However, things may change drastically if once AB 43, all those guidance and, and, and recommendations are for, are put through. Uh, for example, if, if AB 43, there's different methods of actually lowering the speed limits. And, and if we do that and we make the claim later on after seven years, hey, nothing has changed from this evaluation to warrant any increase. Um, and then we can maintain that, that speed limit. So, so there will be a way. I, I'm just, I kind of want to wait to see a little bit more information that comes out of AB 43. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we're going to be reducing these speed limits. That's great. Um, last thing is, I, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Once we get the guidance from AB 43, we may be able to further reduce all the ones that we're reducing now by reducing them now we're not cutting our cutting off our ability to further reduce them down the line right. correctly yes we'll be able to kind of reduce those more once we have those guidance and, and look at that and move forward and, and so they'll I, I want to develop a plan on how we would do that but once we get the guidelines and we'll, we'll move forward doing that great okay thank you i'll make a motion to approve this i'll second Got a motion and a second to approve yeah. the new speed limits. And Mayor Grisanti, I would just note for the record that the uh, Section 2 environmental review was not included in the, the, the ordinance that was presented to you. So if I could just read that into the record briefly before you approve that or call for a vote on that motion. Please read us the uh, environmental. It basically says that the City Council finds that this ordinance is not subject to CEQA pursuant to Sections 15060C2 because the activity will not result in a direct or reasonably uh, foreseeable indirect physical change in the environment and 15060C3 because the activity is not a project as defined in section 15378 of the CEQA guidelines, California Code of Regulations, Title 14, Chapter 3, because it has no potential for resulting in a physical change to the environment directly or indirectly. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Just want to make sure that the ordinance includes that CEQA finding. Thank you, Mr. Cotty. Kelsey, will you take the roll? John, did you also want to read the title of the ordinance before the vote? I would. It's an ordinance of the City of Malibu amending Chapter 10.08 of the Malibu Municipal Code to establish speed limits on city streets and finding the same exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Nicely done. And Mayor Cal Jim Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uri? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. 4C was continued, so that takes us to to 6A, I believe. Do we have Thank to agree to continue that, or it's just continued automatically? It's continued upon approval of the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Paul. That's okay. 6A is a short-term rental ordinance discussion. Can we have the presentation, please? Yes, thank you, Mayor Grisanti. Going on, yes. Um, the item before you is a discussion on the city's uh, proposed short-term rental ordinance. That ordinance was uh, approved by the city council in November of 2020. It is now under review by the California Coastal Commission staff. Uh, the city staff was contacted by coastal staff uh, who advised uh, the city staff that they were leaning toward denial of the city's ordinance, and that was based on their concern that the hosted only ordinance uh, would reduce the number of available short term rentals in the city, and that unlike uh, Santa Monica, who has uh, a hosted ordinance, the city did not have sufficient overnight accommodations such as um, hotels to make up uh, for that loss. Uh, they did offer to uh, work with the city and see if we could come up with a mutually agreeable um, solution or modification to the city's ordinance that would allow them to recommend approval as opposed to uh, recommend denial. And um, they provided several options that other cities were doing uh, that had recently been approved uh, by the Coastal Commission. But uh, some of those are time consuming and uh, the Coastal Commission has to take action on the ordinance by, um, by their 
October meeting. Um, and that is in San Diego. So we're trying to keep it on a local meeting, which it will be in August. And that will be here in uh, Southern California region. Uh, and so um, some of the options they provided, uh, we just did not have the time to do the research on. They did um, offer one solution or one possible uh, modification, and that would be to allow some uh, um, unhosted short-term rentals during certain periods of the year. Uh, the reason this is on the council agenda is staff is seeking direction from the city council on what, if any, uh, modifications you want um, staff to discuss with the Coastal Commission staff uh, to see if we could reach a mutually agreeable um, modification. And with that, I that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. We ask you, or do we have to have public comment first? Mayor, you could ask technical questions, um, but before council deliberates, you'll need to hear public comments. Bruce, do you have a technical question? You're muted. Thank you. Yes, I, I do. It's for John. Um, I understand we can always give direction of any sort at any meeting that's on the agenda, but in order to actually do something different than is in the currently proposed ordinance, would we not have to have a proposed revised ordinance and a public hearing and all that, or can we just change it on the fly? Um, Mayor Horton Silverstein, I'm gonna ask Trevor Resson to jump in. He's your short-term rental ordinance expert. So I'm gonna let him respond to your question. He's prepared to address that. Okay, this, this pertains to any ordinance, I would think, but fine. Sure, at, at this point, you can provide direction to staff because what's gonna come back from the Coastal Commission is gonna be either a certification or a certification with con conditional certification with conditions or a rejection. And this is a, an opportunity whether you want to have staff communicate with the Coastal Commission about exploring potential, um, you know, things that they would accept um, as conditions or what they would propose there or if you just want to um, have them decide on what's been proposed, you're welcome to do that as well. But it is, you don't, you don't need to change, withdraw it and then come with back with the new LCP amendment um, at this point in order to um, go forward with the discussions with the Coastal Commission. Okay, but, but am I correct that before we could ever approve something different than what was already approved, whether it comes back to us or goes forward still, we, we have to have another public hearing and go through the process we Ab went through before? Absolutely. So after the Coastal Commission, whatever discussions happen, I mean, you can give direction to have staff push something forward. Coastal Commission could or could not, you know, agree with that direction and they'll make their decision, which comes back to the city council. At that point, you'll have a public hearing to determine whether you want to amend an ordinance if there's conditions that need to be changed or if you want to reject it or accept what's been proposed. Okay, thank you. Trevor, I have a question for you and Joyce. Yeah. Does the Coastal Commission, the actual commissioners, do they always vote to do exactly what staff says? No, they do not, but they, they do tend to defer a lot to staff. So, and you can also look at the history of the decisions that they have put out there. Um, but it doesn't mean that that's one thing here is you don't know what the Coastal Commission will do. This is what staff is advising at this point. So you hit an important point there. Okay. Should we take public comment now? Do we have anybody that's signed up, Kelsey? Yes, you have 15 speakers. The first few are Bill Sampson, Don Schmitz, Mark Dempster, and Andrew Gombiner. We'll hear from Bill Sampson, Bill Sampson first. Are you there, Bill? Um, yes, I am. Thank you. Seven years ago, I addressed the city council telling them that this problem was not going to go away. I even told them that if they really wanted to have this short-term stuff, that Bill and Rosemary would have a by-the-hour hotel on our street. Now, there are 16 houses on our street. Two of them are Airbnbs. Earlier this evening, a politician, Mrs. Ferrer, shed crocodile tears because children were being squeezed out of Malibu because of option for, I don't know, the Federal Reserve rate, something. It was a little hard to tell. I'll tell you something, Mrs. Fair. I'll quit telling the truth about you when you get lying about me. That Bill, said. 
James, be quiet, Paul. I didn't interrupt you. You have a bully pullet. I get three minutes. Don't interrupt me. Thank you. So, the ill considered interim ordinance, what you did was you ignored as a body, you ignored. And LCP, it was already done. You had coastal approval. You knew this wasn't going to get through coastal. Yet, you created it anyway. You made this into a quagmire. The two houses on my street were occupied by families that attended our local schools and graduated from our high school. That's never no longer going to happen with the money grubbing people that are owning it now. They are absentee landlords, and that's what's going on. I don't understand how any politician can say out of one side of her mouth, hey, let's make things good for the kids and you know, it's too hard for them to grow up in a 2,500 square foot house. Let's make it 4,000 or whatever it happens to be. Some of them couldn't live in a 5,000 square foot house, apparently. Yet, those houses that are about 1,800 square feet are now off the market. Families aren't going to live there. They're supporting an illegal commercial use in our residential neighborhoods. This use does not comply with Municipal Code Section 17.02.030. Those are our mission and vision statements. You guys took an oath to honor that. You promised to enforce our Municipal Code. You let this go, you keep letting it go, you have failed your oath. We don't need these things here litigate it if you have to better to loo try it and lose it than to just throw in the towel as was done with this silly interim ordinance and even sillier posted of ordinance you knew coastal wouldn't approve it go back make them have a real ordinance like silverstein Still, said. that's your time our next speaker is don schmitz followed by mark dempster andrew gombiner and steve kinsey Hi, Don, are you, you available? Yes, sir, can you please pull up my slides? Good evening, Council Members, Don Schmitz. Uh, the Coastal Commission is giving fairly uh, consistent feedback like they have in other communities. And as mentioned in the uh, staff memo, uh, the key is to find a balance that will not overly restrict short-term rentals while at the same time minimizing the impacts on the residential neighborhoods. The coastal staffs indicated that each city council has, has its own set of unique issues. This is pretty consistent. Next slide, please. With what has happened in other communities. Now, our own ordinance specifies that priority shall be given to developments that include public recreational opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, we are representing and working for a property owner in that residential island immediately to the west of Malibu Pier, which is right next to the pier, of course world famous surf rider uh, and all the uh, residential, excuse me, all the commercial opportunities uh, that folks are really looking for for the Malibu experience. Next slide, please. So removing the on-site host and primary residence requirements for this residential island would be consistent with the chapter three policies of the Coastal Act. It provides additional lodging in a prime beach location. It will create more availability for public access and recreational opportunities. Next slide, please. So there's also multiple enforcement provisions to control noise, level disturbance, and other related concerns. Next slide. We don't have to have the on-site uh, where the host is living there, which is uh, gumming up the works with the Coastal Commission staff. And, and we agree that the owner must be available seven days a week, 24 hours a day, should there be a call because there's a complaint as specified in Ordinance 472 of the city. Next slide, please. So uh, there's also grounds for denial and revocation of a short-term rental permit. The city manager can revoke those if there's two or more uh, violations, noise complaints, or three or more within 12 consecutive months. This is an excellent enforcement tool, and it is in ordinance number 472. Next slide. Uh, other coastal cities have a combination of hosted and non-hosted short-term rentals, and this is something that the Coastal Commission staff has conveyed to the city staff as well, which is on page two of the council agenda report. It's also my personal experience up and down the coast. Next slide. 
So the city of Malibu can include a combination of both hosted and non-hosted short-term rentals based upon the specific circumstances within the neighborhood which is being served, which I think will go a long way for the more nuanced approach that the Coastal Commission is looking for. And short-term rentals and local coastal program amendments are routinely approved by the Coastal Commission. And to speak to uh, uh, Councilman Silverstein's uh, query, uh, of course, Trevor is correct. The official terminology is suggested modifications, and almost every local coastal program amendment has suggested modifications, which will, of course, be deliberated upon by the City Council after the Coastal Commission approves the LCPA with, of, of course, all the opportunities for public input. So with that, Don, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Don. Our next speaker is Mark Dempster, followed by Andrew Gompiner, Steve Kinsey, and Joe Drummond. Mr. Dempster, are you available? Good evening, uh, council members. Uh, thank you for taking my comments. Uh, my name is Mark, and uh, my wife Kim and I are the homeowners of 23006 Pacific Coast Highway. Um, if you're trying to draw a mental map, we um, are right next door to the pier. Um, Malibu Farm is our immediate neighbor to the east, and uh, Aviator Nation, Jack in the Box, and Surfrider Motel are our neighbors across the street on the uh, north side of PCH. Um, our primary residence is currently in San Francisco, um, but we spend as much as many weeks and months as we can in Malibu as our schedule allows. Uh, we anticipate our time in Malibu to increase upon uh, my retirement in a few years. Um, we believe that a homeowner or a designated representative ought to personally vet a prospective guest before booking their property. Um, we believe that they should greet guests in person to both check them in and run them through house and city rules. Uh, we believe that uh, they should monitor guests throughout their stay, uh, either through the homeowner uh, or a property manager. Um, we believe they should be immediately available to city compliance personnel. And then should the guests violate any rules, uh, we believe um, the homeowner should have the ability to evict guests immediately. Uh, this is why um, we would never list our property on Airbnb because their click to book feature prevents homeowners from betting uh, potential guests. We would also never provide a lockbox for self check-in. Um, our address does have a short-term rental permit, uh, but we have yet to engage in a single booking. Um, having said this, uh, specific to our address uh, with its proximity to predominantly commercial enterprises, uh, and the coastline, we politely uh, make the following uh, requests um, that the city remove the on-site host requirement and that the city remove the primary residency requirement, which mandates uh, 185 days per year um, to be in the property. Uh, otherwise, uh, to be clear, uh, Kim and I are fully supportive of the majority of the regulations uh, in the proposed ordinance. Um, we believe that's the homeowner's responsibility. Uh, thank you again for uh, taking my comments. Thank you, Mr. Dempster. Our next speaker is Andrew Gombiner, followed by Steve Kinsey, Joe Drummond, and Craig Hill. Mr. Gombiner, are you available? Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, I've owned a three-unit multifamily property on Malibu Road for over 33 years and have rented it as STRs since 2016 to over 2,000 families and groups without ever receiving a neighbor complaint. Up and down the California coast, the Coastal Commission has required other cities to maintain beachfront STRs while allowing the reduction of inland STRs. In Malibu, beachfront multifamily zones are the most appropriate places for SDRs as they are inherently more transient and do not affect inland single family neighborhoods where there is the, the greatest community concern. At the same time, they provide the most affordable beach access to visitors. I suggest Malibu remove restrictions on the number of STRs in beachfront multifamily zones. This would likely make the reduction of STRs in inland single family zones more, accept, more acceptable to the Coastal Commission. In San Diego, for example, the Commission recently allowed a 1% cap on the number of STRs throughout the city, except for Mission Beach, a beachfront neighborhood where the cap is significantly higher. 
In September 2020, <clears throat> prior to the enactment of the enforcement ordinance, I researched on Airbnb and VRBO and found that there were approximately 75 distinct multifamily SDRs in Malibu, all of them beachfront. <clears throat> so we're not talking about many. As an alternative to placing restrictions on the number of multifamily STRs, the Commission has agreed in the past to grandfathering historic STRs at or close to the beach with caps that allow for modest future growth of inventory. I believe Malibu has the opportunity to protect its most concerned neighborhoods while ensuring this ordinance reflects the Coastal Act's mandate to protect affordable overnight accommodations along the coast. This minor modification to your ordinance will go a long way to achieving Coastal Commission support and restoring our history of providing these important visitor accommodations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gombiner. Our next speaker would be Steve Kinsey, but I don't see him in the meeting, so we'll try to circle back and we'll hear from Joe Drummond, followed by Craig Hill, Colin Drummond, and Barbara Ann Goldstein. Hi, Joe, are you available? I am city council. Colin and I in the past rented out our primary residence short term one summer for six weeks and during the Christmas and Thanksgiving holidays when we went out of town. We didn't even know we needed a TOT number as we did it so infrequently and was brand new and got dinged for thousands of dollars in penalties that, that we paid the city of Malibu. We haven't had any short term rentals for two years. To address comments of code violations on my property, we built a 69 square foot deck that according to section 106.3 work exempted this does not require a building permit but we found out that we do apparently also need a planning apr we have found it very difficult to find available geotechnical engineer to complete the work required for geotechnical review for under the full cost of the deck but we are working on it so back to strs honestly if people don't want strs we are fine with renting out our place for 30 days or longer in the summer I do think that one bedroom apartments pose no threat to neighborhoods and families leaving town, so they should be allowed to operate without any hosted ordinance, but for sure corporations should not be allowed to operate hotels in residential neighborhoods. If you were to do a compromise that the Coastal Commission could accept, then perhaps allow all one bedroom apartments to be STRs and anything two bedroom and above to be limited to only primary residence for a period of time not greater than three months. This should be enough for families renting out their homes to make ends meet or pay property taxes, college tuitions, etc., and still give a good amount to TOT and appease the Coastal Commission as this can accommodate the peak summer season of visitors being able to provide enough lodging. You can also make a 24-7 hotline for any infractions during this time, such as noise, etc. But again, if the city would rather put a hard stop on short-term rentals for places over one bedroom, then we can understand this to retain the rural and local character of our neighborhoods. But restricting one bedroom apartments that are not in a restricted HOA, it seems too harsh as these are perfect for visitors looking for a hotel option. Thanks for your thoughtful consideration. Thank you, Joe. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Colin Drummond, Barbara Ann Goldstein, and Stephen Hakeem. Uh-oh, looks like I'm in a Drummond sandwich. Wow. When, when future historians look back, these moments now will be seen as a major inflection point in Malibu's evolution. It's time for a reset in our thinking about STRs. The legal terrain has been shifting, and we face a huge decision. Do we want to keep neighborhoods that provide the blessings of quiet seclusion, to use the term coined by the Supreme Court? And are we prepared to uphold the various attributes in the general plan, including, quoting, preserving unaltered rural character and from the municipal code, maintaining low density residential development in a manner which respects surrounding property owners and the environment? Or will we let our town be taken over by the investor class, one Airbnb and Picasa at a time, to be made into an Instagram reality show travelocity destination for the tourist class? And what about the 4,000 seat arena proposed by Pepperdine? They must be envisioning sporting tournaments that go on for several days each. Maybe it'll be a venue for the March Madness round of 64 and scheming about where all the spectators will crash after the nightly parties. If we don't reverse this trend towards commodification of our housing stock, we might as well just extend the Malibu Pier a little bit so the cruise ships can unleash their teeming human cargo upon our shores. That same Supreme Court decision that I referenced uh, characterizes halfway houses and by definition SDRs 
as presenting inherently urban problems. More people in a given space, more cars, more noise, etc. Those are violations of what the court calls sanctuary. So with our zoning code, we're allowed to have neighborhoods for residents only. We don't shun tourists. We have the CV zones, which expressly accommodate them. We have no obligation to allow our neighborhoods to be turned into a thousand tiny hotels filled with strangers. So let's stop selling out our community one single family at a time, repeal the interim ordinance and enforce the zoning code we already have. Don't be deterred by the threat of litigation. It's coming one way or another. So let's step up and face the threat on our own terms. And we're getting to election season. The way you handle this now will say more about how much you care about the community than any aspirational words you might print on a full color campaign mailer. The vast majority of residents would much prefer to forego a few million dollars in TOT and the incremental benefit that re represents in favor of the blessings of quiet seclusion for which most of us came here in the first place. Thanks. Our Thank next you. speaker, we have Colin Drummond, followed by Barbara Ann Goldstein, Stephen Hakeem, and Scott Dietrich. Hi, Colin, are you available? Yes, I am. Um, thank you, um, uh, honorable city council members. Um, I, you know, I just want to make a, an argument for common sense regulation. Um, I, I think we just need to be able to balance the competing uh, needs that exist within our community and for people who want to come and spend some time in Malibu. Um, so, you know, even Washington is managing to do a little bit of common sense uh, legislation right now. So I think if we can balance people who want to come visit um, and have access to Malibu, there's very few places to stay. Just use the regulations, um, give people an opportunity to be here. Um, as Joe mentioned, we're taking Mikey's advice that he gave months ago. We're doing a monthly um, instead of um, anything short term right now and, and and we're fine with that but we do think you know um, people should be able to stay like in a wooden bedroom that's not going to damage you know our culture um, uh, you know we're a we're a community of what is it 10,000 people um, so um, and we have millions of people come visiting anyway and if we have people that are allowed to stay here they're going to put more money into our community. They'll be going more to the restaurants. They'll be shopping at Ralph's and Whole Foods, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think if we just manage it in a common sense way, then, then, then everybody will, will be happy. So that, you know, that's really all I wanted to say. I, I just would love for us to be a little less extreme and just find something common sense that makes sense for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Ann Goldstein, followed by Stephen Hakeem, Scott Dietrich, and Ryan. Barbara, are you available? Barbara, you should have a pop-up. Oh, he hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank okay, you. Uh, good evening, and thank you to everyone who does so much for Malibu, the city I love. I have lived next door to a home that has run as a hotel for 16 years. I was here first. Of course, I wouldn't have moved into a home next to a home that's run as a hotel. I want to state that I am all for the city of Malibu to exercise the STR unit hosted ordinance which would require presence of an on-site host during STRs. I am all for this. If this cannot be passed for whatever reason, then I beg that, a, that there could be different permits, the different permit types with non-primary resident operating STRs only between for example, April 1st and September 30th of each year. Again, my first wish is that non-primary residents not be allowed to do STRs at all. However, the thought of six months 
perhaps would be going forward and in the future something else could be changed. I want to comment that over the 16 years, I've talked to many people who have called the sheriff's department. They're wonderful, hardworking people. And they always come out and they always stop a party. But according to what I read in the ordinances, you need to have a, a citation written for noise. And that means the sheriff's department has to come out twice in the 24 hour period. That would hardly ever happen because our sheriff's department does their job fantastically. They make it known in a calm, cool, intelligent way. Stop the party. Because if we come back, there will be no party. I also think that all STRs that share a common property with another property, like an entry area or steps, common property, they should be required by law to take an extra million dollars in liability insurance. And I do not think that any STR should be allowed if they, their front door is 15 feet or less from a neighbor's front door. It just doesn't seem right. If someone's buying a property in Malibu that they want to do STRs in, surely they wouldn't pick some property that's just 10 feet away from someone else's front door. I do not like living around strangers. I absolutely love Malibu. I love the sound of the ocean from my master bedroom. I often, Our more times than not, time. have to sleep in the guest room and listen to PCH because the ocean, because the ocean sound is ruined by constant parting and noise next door. Thank, uh, thank you. Barbara, that's your time. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, good night and thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Hakeem, followed by Scott Dietrich, Ryan, and Dorina Shiro. Mr. Hakeem, are you available? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Stephen Hakeem, commercial property owner in Malibu. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. And uh, Joyce, it's good to see you again, as I know you're very familiar with our proposed project. Um, it is obviously apparent that, um, excuse me, it's obviously apparent that the Airbnb problem has gone rampant in the city and the shortage in transient room occupancy seems to be a severe problem in the city of Malibu, which we all have been saying for years now. The Coastal Commission's actions over the last few weeks in recommending denial of the LCPA is further proof of their dire support of transient rooms within the city. We have been diligently working on a state-of-the-art 20-room motel project, which has been in the pipeline for over 10 years now, and our initial hearing with the Planning Commission being about a year ago now. The hearings are persistently continued to further hearings, but we have been ready to come back to the Planning Commission for months now. At the request of the Planning Commission, we reconfirmed from the Regional Water Quality Control Board that they are in support of the motel project as proposed, and we also already have the support of the Coastal Commission. Countless residents and supporters of the motel have continued to ask when it will finally come back to the Commission to be heard as they are excited about the project. We have an incredible solution for the city with this project, but these delays are costing the city hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. While the agenda for tonight's hearing has outlined the preliminary loss estimate expected to be $2 million to $3 million for transient revenue. This project site is already zoned for a motel and fits perfectly within the surrounding area next to the Surfrider Motel, the Malibu Beach Inn, and the Malibu Pier. The project is essentially a by right project with only minor variances, variances which are substantiated by various findings and is well over parked, which is extremely rare in Malibu and in that immediate area. We estimate that we can generate half a million to a million dollars in TOT revenue to the city or approximately $2,000 a day. It's time to get this back to the commission. Please help us push this project along to be part of the solution to help better the city, 
fill the much needed void and bring in much needed additional revenue. The new motel will transform the unpleasant look of the abandoned parking lot into a beautiful motel that Malibu will be proud of and hopefully the neighbors in the city will also be proud of as well. Thank you for your time as always and appreciate your service. Thank you, Mr. Hakeem. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, followed by Ryan, Darina Shiro, and Marianne Riggins. Hi, Scott. Are you available? Thank you, Paul. I am. We are at a crossroads in the city. Uh, Coastal Commission wants to turn Malibu into a hotel. Period. And you all were there. We spent several years with packed rooms at the council chambers. And out of this was crafted a compromise ordinance, the hosted STRs. People on both sides wanted something else, but we came to a solution using the democratic process. And now this unelected staff at Coastal has spent a year and a half only to say, no, we want to turn Malibu into a hotel. People do not want STRs in their neighborhood, period. They accepted the idea, okay, if you're going to host something, okay, that means you're going to look out for the people, you're going to control it. We're not going to have problems. That was a sensible compromise. Now Coastal saying no. And I'm going, why? It's not like anybody of modest means is going to come out here and rent a house. When you look at Airbnb, a landside house cost about nine grand a week. Who living in South Central can afford that. Uh-uh. This is about Coastal's very bizarre one-sided view. And they want to turn Malibu, like I said, into a bloody hotel. And I think it's time that we stand up and tell them, look, if you don't like that, let's revert back to our LCP that Coastal's approved already. And that just bans businesses anywhere in a residential neighborhood. And that was really, this is really the point, the differentiation of running a business or having a residential use. If you live there, it's still a residential use. If you rent out a room or a couple rooms or part of your house, if you don't live there, corporations, heads, funds, whatever, no, it's a business. And I think a lot of businesses are watching us to see what happens, because if we open the door to STRs everywhere, you're going to see so many properties bought up, and now we will become a big hotel. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Darina Shiro and Marianne Riggins. Mr. Embry. Uh, yes, good evening. Um, I'd like to see the written response from Coastal that infers that there's going to be a staffer going to write a report to recommend denial of our LCP application, which is getting on a year now since it was submitted. I can understand there's probably been a barrage of letters from uh, master hosts or whatever they super hosts that have uh, besieged the staff at the uh, Coastal Commission. But, uh, you know, the Coastal Commission staff is not a tourism board. It's not their purview on this item. We have hotel projects, obviously, that are coming before the city and one that's approved. So I think that um, that notion is beyond their purview. And I'd like to know why this staff member thinks that the coastal can get away with this. Uh, they think they're the parking police as well. Uh, 
and and things like that. You know, we can't mark a you know no parking next to a fire hydrant because it was traditional that people could park there. We got to create a, a equal number of spaces somewhere else. I don't know where that notion came from, but that's not in the Coastal Act, and neither is this. So you need to, I guess, ignore staff. It's one thing to puff and and make the city um, staff write up, you know, hearsay comments in a report. But I hate to say that's what they are. Where's the coastal staff? Where's Denise? Is she in this meeting? Is anybody from coastal in this meeting? And why not? You know, they don't have a written report and we're getting it, you know, kind of secondhand. I'm not saying that Denise didn't say that and that the Joyce didn't get it right in her, her memo. But the audacity of the staff members uh, in the Ventura office to start promoting tourism and turning our residential homes into motels. Uh, that's against the ordinance that the Coastal Commission adopted and approved. Our LCP, which we didn't have a whole lot of say in, I think Joyce had some say in that matter, by the way, but the local implementation plan and the LCP, these are state law. The city is to abide by them and enforce them. And it's not up to coastal staff to say don't enforce them and suggest an alternate use. I, I think that's quite scandalous of, of a coastal staff member to say something that's contrary to the state law. Now you all took an oath of office to uphold state law and that's what we need to do. Maybe there should just not be any more short-term rentals period. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I don't see Darina Shiro in the meeting, so we'll hear from Marianne Riggins next and then try to circle back. Hi, Marianne, are you available? Hi, uh, yes, I am. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add a few comments. Um, I don't think that we should have a hosted ordinance. I do think we do need an ordinance. There should be permits. Um, I think our permitting program that we implemented where it checks for code enforcement, it checks for septic issues, are excellent suggestions. I think we need to look at a compromise. Um, Short-term rentals can benefit residents um, by adding additional income. But I think we need to look back at to what short-term rentals started with vacation house swaps back 15, 20 years ago and try and more closely mimic something like that. Something that has limited use, that a resident can um, trade out their home or short-term rental their home for maybe 60 days throughout the entire year. Um, that allows them enough time to be able to earn a little extra income, but it also doesn't put too much pressure on the neighbors or the community. Um, having something that does require that there be some type of 24 hour availability of somebody to respond to issues or problems that are occurring. Um, and um, I did like one of the earlier speakers uh, where they talked about, you know, possibly having somebody that greets the, the visitor there um, to give them an overview and to lay out specific rules for our community could be something we should consider. Um, but I don't think that a ban is the right extreme and also fully unregulated. Um, perhaps if we do limit the amount of time, it will encourage less corporate operation of these and more just residential to balance um, the needs of the community and the property owner. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And Mayor, we're circling back now to Steve Kinsey, who we do have in the meeting. Mr. Kinsey, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thanks for this opportunity to speak to you about the city's pending LCP amendment on the short-term rentals. I'm speaking to you as a former county supervisor who also served on the Coastal Commission from 2011 to 2017 and chaired the commission during my last three years uh, before leaving office. So I'm quite familiar with the topic of short-term rentals and have followed the path of many coastal jurisdictions as they work to balance preservation of their communities with the Coastal Act's strong emphasis on local lower cost visitor accommodations near the beach. 
I'm also speaking tonight on behalf of a multifamily beachfront property owner in your city who has rented multifamily short-term rental units in a building where he has a city permit to do so. He's paid TOT on each of the units and has never had a complaint filed against him or his guests. When your enforcement ordinance went into effect in January, he lost one of his short-term rentals. And if the hosted ordinance were adopted without revision, he would only be allowed one short-term rental. In fact, all three and four unit buildings would be limited to one short-term rental. This would be a reduction of 66 to 75% of the possible short-term rentals in those buildings. So consistently, the Coastal Commission has recognized that short-term rentals are often the most affordable form of lodging compared to hotels, and that's very true in Malibu as well. And while the Commission has recognized the benefit of allowing coastal cities and counties to tailor their short-term rental ordinances to address specific priorities, they have frequently required revisions to ordinances that don't adequately balance the community preservation with affordable visitor access. Uh, at this time, as you know, the Commission staff is on record that Malibu's ordinance is too restrictive as written. So rather than rigidly proceeding with certain denial of your ordinance, I'm encouraging you to authorize your staff to negotiate revisions to Ordinance 472 in order to preserve the substantial investment that you and your residents have made in shaping it over these past six years. If you choose that path, I want to also encourage you to prioritize loosening restrictions or grandfathering in the multifamily short-term rentals that were previously available closest to the beach. Other municipalities have done so, and their ordinances have been approved by the commission. So thank you at this late hour for your ongoing commitment to public service and recognizing the value of sharing your precious coastline with those aren't fortunate enough to live there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kinsey. Please hang around for questions. And I still don't see Darina Shiro in the meeting, so that concludes public comments. Okay, can we go to council comments? And if I can jump ahead of everybody, I'd love to ask Mr. Kinsey a question. You use the term affordable short-term rentals. What is an affordable short-term rental? Well, as I said, it's a relative comment. Um, if you compare um, what short-term rentals have uh, relative to the hotel rates that you have in your city, and you consider that short-term rentals allow people to um, bring their own food, cook their own food, have more than uh, two people in a room, um, you end up with something that is relatively the most affordable way for many people to reach the coast. You and I would agree, I'm sure, Mayor, that the coast is a very expensive place to visit anymore. We're never going to be able to make it uh, low cost, but it is a lower cost way for visitors to spend time at the beach. And many families have chosen that because they love being at the coast. And this is one of the few ways that they can be there. Do you have any kind of a dollar amount that you would consider to be low cost or affordable? You know, I don't, but I would say that uh, you, uh, your city has provided uh, the coastal staff with some, some statistics as to what they consider to be the average hotel rooms uh, versus the average short-term rentals. And I, I, I think I can say safely that uh, they were about half the average price of the hotel room or, or less. Thank you. Karen, you're first, followed by Bruce. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, thank you to all the speakers. I've got some questions, probably for Trevor, maybe for Joyce. Um, I was trying to figure out today, when was the interim ordinance passed? The current ordinance. Joyce, do you have the day it was at the same time as the um, LCP amendment ordinance, the hosted ordinance, they went through at the same time? It was no, it was, it was the be end of September of 2020. I can give you the exact date if it's important. Okay, is that confirmed? 
Joyce, you're muted, but that, that sounds right to me. Okay. September, All right. Um, September Doug... 29th. And then second reading was, um, no, that was the second reading, September 29th. Okay. Bruce, maybe my questions are for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Doug is not here, so I'm not sure who will be uh, answering the questions I would have asked him. Um, I'm curious about the number of complaints that the city receives before and after that interim ordinance was passed. Mr. Member Fair, I'm happy to answer the question. I did check with our code enforcement officer, Doug Cleavager, today. Uh, he said that uh, for this year, calendar year 2022, um, they received, I believe your question at this point was number of complaints. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this year they have received six complaints on short-term rentals, which staff investigated and they did not find any evidence of violation. Okay. Uh, but we're talking about something that was passed in September of 2020. So what I'm looking for is the difference between when that interim ordinance was passed uh, as opposed to now. So I'm trying to figure out how effective it's been. The, the interim ordinance is is um, is not being is, is not being enforced now because it, it's not law yet because it has not been approved by the Coastal Commission. That's not correct. Uh, the, the interim ordinance is in place. It's the host ordinance that's uh, that we're talking oh, about. Oh yes, that's. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought that's what you were referring to. The ordinance that was before the city. Uh, no, Coastal Commission. What's currently in place? That's what I'm looking okay. for. What, the what's the difference ordinance. before okay. and after that? So if, if I could try to answer that, and I'm sorry, he did not have specific quantitative information, but Mr. Clevenger indicated that the number of complaints that the city received uh, on STRs after the enforcement ordinance took effect dropped considerably. Did not like, have something specific have, on that? I... Uh, probably to a fraction of that. He didn't specify, but it, it sounds like it went from a large number to, to next to none. Okay, so it sounds like it's been effective. Um, he, would, he would characterize it as being effective in terms of reducing the number of complaints. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so short-term rental revenue for fiscal year 21-22, can somebody remind me of that? Yeah. Sure we can find that for you. $5 million. For, for fiscal year 21, 22. It's, it's been in the neighborhood of 5 million for the last two years. That's good. So here's another question, Steve. I don't know if you're gonna know this. What percentage of the overall market, whether it's statewide, nationwide, what percentage of the market is hosted short-term rental? We were trying to get some information on that. Um, Adrian, were you able to find some information on uh, on the number of hosted out there? You know, unfortunately, we weren't able to. I think that's information we can we can provide uh, to the council. Unfortunately, we just um, the question came up right before this meeting. We couldn't. We didn't have enough time to get that. Well, that looks like a critical factor to me. What's the demand for that? If it's two percent of the market. You know, that'll just kill short term rental period. But I think it's important to know how much of the market it is. So can can I ask for follow through on that answer? Sure. Are you specifically wanting to know what we have in our market or are you wanting to know what's in Southern California? Uh, you know, well, host I'd like to should be able to do it for the city, right? I think they don't they keep that stat, Adrian. Well, I, could I ask for overall statewide? Sure, I, we'll, I, that. I, we'll bring that to count. My guess is that the demand for hosted is very low, but I'd like to know what the numbers are. Um, so how, how much revenue are we talking about losing if we only do hosted? It's been estimated that we could uh, lose two to three million dollars in revenue annually. 
Okay, Ruthie, is that right? I know I know you've given that, us some that numbers. Is, that is correct, and um, I received that estimate from um, our predecessor, Lisa, who was basing that on a 25 to 40 percent loss of that um, particular revenue item. Okay, um, so I would assume the city has made plans with uh, how to deal with the potential loss of revenue. Can anybody talk about that? What, what would be some of the options? So um, again, and as um, has been discussed a couple of times at council, but it's, it's great to have the refresher. About a year ago, when the budget was being contemplated at this time last year, there was anticipated a significant shortfall in resources and part of that did include um, the implementation of the new ordinance and at that time council asked ANF to uh, specifically um, take that matter up and investigate additional revenue generating um, options which uh, were brought back to to ANF, um, they gave direction for um, specific um, analysis on three different options, and that was uh, done. And over the course of the past four or five months, we've discussed that at ANF and then brought that to council. And that's part of um, finding out from our community, our your constituents, the feeling for a potential increase in the TUT, which is a component of the sales tax. So we investigated and um, we're looking to generate additional revenue in order to make up some of that shortfall. Now, since that time, of course, in the last year, revenues have rebounded and are at this time remain strong as I previously reported. However, we do um, uh, always, we're always cautious of particular economic indicators indicating uh, a, a slowdown. Okay, thank you, Ruthie. Okay, so perhaps a ballot measure to increase taxes. Okay. Um, and are we looking at areas to cut in spending with this loss of revenue? Not, not at this time. We have, um, over the past several years, have been in a budget reduction mode. And um, in fact, this year, uh, have looked to make specific investments in the areas that we discussed earlier this evening, staffing, technology, and maintaining our commitment to the city's mission and vision. Um, I also will say that um, during the height of those um, economic concerns, staff for they um, forfeited the increase in uh, the coal increase in their salaries. And it was attempted to smooth that out over a couple of years, but this is the first year in three years where uh, we're actually recommending the COLA that was um, published for the 12 month period preceding February, 2022. Right, okay, thank you. Yes, and that was a, a noble gesture on the part of the staff. And, and, uh, and I, I know that wasn't an easy thing for you all to recommend. Okay, those are my questions for the moment. I'm gonna have more later, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bruce, your hand is raised. Yeah. By. All right. So, you know, it, it's, it's 11, it's almost 1130. And this is like a vitally critical issue, uh, which we can't possibly do justice to in the time that's remaining. And I, I think we're going to need to continue this to a special meeting of its own or, or, or something because it's just not appropriate. I mean, here we go again. We've had, I don't know how many hearings to get to where we are. And this is extremely compromised. It's a compromise. It was worked out delicately. We've, we've probably heard comment from 100 or more residents over the years, probably maybe hundreds at, between the writings and the oral comments. And um, we're being asked late at night with, with, with very little commentary to decide whether to make a major change to this already delicately balanced compromise proposal. I think that's just not doable. Um, I have a lengthy presentation that I was going to make about the legality of what's being proposed, about coastal commission's authority, about 
the current state of the law in Malibu about how we got here. And I'm not going to do that because there's just not the time to do it. We'd have to be here till one in the morning. So I'm just going to respond to some comments that were made, but I'm going to request that we not give any guidance tonight because it's just not appropriate. Mr. Kinsey, his credentials are outstanding. And had he not told us he's basically lobbying on behalf of a client tonight, I'd be much more interested in what he has to say, but he's basically an advocate. So I can't accept objectively what he has to say tonight, unfortunately. So that's just the way the world works, right? When you're a paid advocate, you put forth a one-sided proposition. You don't lie, but you say it, you spin it as best you can. And that's all we're going to get from someone who's a lobbyist. So that's unfortunate. The concept that short-term rentals on the beach in Malibu are affordable. I mean, there's no average resident of the state of California or in this country for that matter, who can afford to come stay on the beach in Malibu at a short-term rental. Let's put that preposterous notion aside. It's just not the case. Very wealthy people who want to stay at the beach in Malibu can stay at a short-term rental on the beach because it costs a fortune to do it. And I don't think that's what the Coastal Act's about. I don't think the Coastal Act's about preserving access to the beach to multimillionaires. So I take that with a huge grain of salt. The issue of revenue, by God's, I mean, you know, look, we could open a Chumash Casino in Malibu and make a ton of revenue. We could have a theme park here. We could probably authorize offshore drilling. I think I heard earlier tonight, let's extend the pier and invite cruise ships. This isn't about revenue. This is about quality of life in Malibu. And yeah, having less revenue is going to mean we have to do something to maintain quality of life in other ways. But this is not about revenue. And when the conversation becomes about revenue, it just shows that it's not about quality of life. Anyway, what about a long-term rental tax? That would probably equal the short-term rental tax that's illegally being applied to hotels in communities where we're not allowed to have them in the first place. The best arguments that I hear for allowing short-term rentals in our residential neighborhoods come from non-resident owners. They're not our constituents. You know, our constituents live here. Our constituents are the primary residents of Malibu. They do not want, for the most part, short-term rentals. Sure, people in San Francisco want them that own something in Malibu that's producing revenue. I imagine people in Moscow want them too. But I really don't care about those people. They're not my constituents. Coastal has, and let's get this straight, Coastal's not told us anything. An employee of Coastal has supposedly told us something. We don't know exactly what, but it's not Coastal. It's like when our staff gives us recommendations. We often follow them, and we also sometimes don't. And I think we need to take this to the deciders, not the people, not the functionaries that work for them. Worst that's going to happen is we lose. Okay, well, we already have a majorly compromised proposal. Then we'll be back to the drawing board. That's fine. I said, I've got a lengthy presentation that shows that our law currently without this proposal is that you're not allowed to have short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods, full stop. In fact, Christy Hogan gave that advice to the city council and to Bill Sampson five, six years ago, but it wasn't shared with Mikey and Karen when they voted on the current proposal. And I don't know that it was shared with the prior city council that made the ill-advised decision to start charging temporary transient occupancy tax on unlawful short-term rentals. And by the way, our TOT statute expressly says that by getting a permit to charge the tax, you're not, I'm sorry, by getting the certification that you're required to do to get the tax, you're not being given a permit. You have to lawfully have that separate and apart from the TOT statute. That doesn't do anything. So in any event, there's a lot of law. There are recent decisions of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. I was going to go through all of these tonight. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the Supreme Court of New Hampshire, all of which have addressed this fundamental problem of whether 
residential zoning ordinances, just like ours, permit short-term rentals or don't, and they've concluded, no, they don't. At least they've concluded that city councils or township councils who've construed their zoning law to prohibit short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods to transient tourists, they've said that's a reasonable interpretation. And that fact is what Christy Hogan told the city council six years ago, that that's a reasonable interpretation and that it's up to the city council to decide whether to adopt that interpretation or reject that interpretation. But what did, what was the city council told when it was considering this ordinance? I was a resident then, I was not on council, I wasn't even contemplating political career of any sort. And I remember going to meeting after meeting and hearing the city manager saying, we must have a statute like this if we're gonna do anything because the current law permits this. The staff said that in repeated staff um, reports. That was untrue, it was a false statement. The current law, until the interim ordinance was adopted, did not permit short-term rentals. Now, Trevor is gonna tell you that because we have failed to, to um, enforce our law for so long, we now must go through coastal to enforce the law that we've always had. He may be right, he may be wrong. There are Court of Appeals decisions from California that support what Trevor will tell you, but there's no California Supreme Court decision that will tell you what Trevor is gonna tell you, and Trevor will tell you that, that the California Supreme Court has not ruled on this important question of California law. And when I was practicing law and a new issue came up and the associate came to me and said, okay, I, you know, what do you want me to research? I'd say, I want you to tell me whether the highest court of our land has definitively ruled on this question. That's the first thing I want you to answer. Because if the highest court has not ruled on it, we don't have law yet. All we have are indications as to what the law might be. All we have are indications as to what the law might be. And it's time to stand up for our residents and, and support the law that we've always had that Coastal gave us 30 years ago, which says, that residential neighborhoods are for residents. Now, again, I'm not gonna read the, I, I do want to go through this in detail because we've been given false information for many years now. And we've had public hearings in which the public was deceived. But the fact is there's, there's, there's substantial support for the proposition that Malibu does not currently permit short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods. And I think we need to have a full public discussion of that before we approve any potential weakening of what's already a compromise proposal. Uh, Barbara Ann Goldstein, bless her heart. I mean, she, I, I think also she, she, she gave the resident view, the real resident view. And I, I just wanna make a point, it's also, you know, very sweet woman. She's made some great comments. She made them as um, appropriately as one could imagine. Interestingly, when her time was up, she was not cut off because people on this council who have control over the mic, when they don't like the person speaking or don't like what they're hearing or don't like the way it's being presented, cut them off immediately the second they can, maybe even interrupt them while they're speaking. But when someone says something that resonates, they're allowed to speak. And that's just not the way this should work. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Everybody's entitled to express it the way they want to express it. And we shouldn't be censoring our residents in, the, in what they say and the way they want to say it. Um, so like I said, I, I, this to me is far too important to decide at 11.30 to midnight um, on a Monday evening when so much has been put into this. And I'm going to, in deference to council and to the staff and to the public, not go into the entire presentation. I have posted things on um, social media that lay out in exquisite detail the legal issues, as well as the factual history of how we got where we are today. And I, I, I Mikey and Karen, really, I encourage you to have an open mind because you were, fit, you were, you were given a bill of goods. You were given false information. You were given inadequate information. And it's time to open your eyes and look at what the truth is and make a decision based on what our residents want, what our residents deserve. So thanks, that's my comments.
Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my disclosure is I'm not feeling well and I'm about done, guys. Just FYI, I'm hanging in by a thread here. I just have a couple comments on this. Um, I listen to my Malibu friends, Malibu neighbors here, and it's just, I guess it's like other things, but just so apparent that we, many of us see the world differently, listen to everyone talk, and it, it just depends on where you come from, what your needs are, what your view of Malibu is, but I think the part that, that makes me sad over this is that if people disagree, they get demonized. You're told you're breaking the law, you've ruined Malibu. And that's too bad because you know what? I'm gonna share my honest opinion. I've been at the city over 10 years now. And on this issue, I feel like I know less than I've ever known. I wanna quote one of the emails we got, Cindy Martin talking about Section 3004 of the Coastal Act. The legislator further finds and declares that <clears throat> to achieve maximum responsiveness to local conditions, accountability, and public accessibility, it is necessary to rely heavily on local government and local land use planning procedures and enforcement. But I look at all the years I've spent here. And that's not often how it comes across. What I see is when it comes to issues like short-term rentals, roadside parking restrictions, pesticides, option four on our land, you know, fire rebuilds. We have, don't really have that decision, you know, apparently, according to the Coastal Commission. We are... They like this, seems like they want us to make a decision, but then they want to pick it apart. So what I don't know, and I guess my just overall question, I don't even know if I want it answered is, what flexibility do we really have to choose? And if we make a decision that doesn't follow the Coastal Commission, I've seen how viciously they go after people and take them to court and sue them. Would that be our fate? I have no idea. And it makes me wonder why we've spent so much time on this issue, so much time. When in reality, <laughs> Coastal Commission seems to have their own ideas that supersede ours. And so I... I just feel completely lost. I hear Bruce, I hear the Hakeems, I hear I hear all sorts of different voices. Right now, maybe because I'm not feeling well and I'm, I'm done, but I feel like I know less about where we should go. You know, I don't want to, I don't know that I want to sign up for a multi-million dollar lawsuit, or maybe I do. I don't even know that. Um, so I feel like I need, I need some education on how we're supposed to navigate this because frankly, all my years here, I feel like I know less than I did 10 years ago. So that's my comments. Thank you, Mikey. Steve, I'm gonna go ahead and say what I wanna say because it isn't gonna take long. The, mo the best idea I've heard tonight was delivered by Scott Dietrich and Scott's thought was that we should go back to staff of the Coastal Commission and say, if you don't like this, then have the council, have the commissioners go ahead and vote it down. And then we will be back to our original coastal plan, which has no short-term rentals in it. So pick your poison. I like that. I like that. I like the attitude. I think it's, it's a, uh, Actions have consequences. They don't want us to do, live the way we want to live. Then let them make the decision they really don't want us to make. I mean, what are they going to do? Tell us we have to 
file a whole new coastal plan now because what we've been operating under for years isn't correct? If you, if you meet with them and tell them that that's what we're interpreting the coastal plan we've had for what, 24 years now, something like that. If we tell them that's what the way we're interpreting it and if they don't, if they don't enact what we gave them, then we are, you know, we're back to that and thank you very much. And we're not, we're not losing any affordable beachfront rentals anyway. So that's my thoughts on it. Steve Uring, please. I don't disagree with what you just said. Uh, you know, well, you, I, and Scott Dietrich are agreeing on something. There's, there's, you know, there's something going on here. It's late. <laughs> but you're right. Now, look, I mean, you know, it's interesting. The, the last couple of weeks, I've been getting calls from, from residents who are saying, you know, Steve, what's wrong with it? What's going wrong with our city? You know, it seems like we're getting nibbled to death by ducks, right? Everything, you know, so we, we lose something over here. We lose something over here. I wake up in the morning, there's a short-term rental next to me, which wasn't there before. Uh, so so I think, and, and their advice is very similar to what Paul just came up with. He says, why don't you guys stand up for us and do the right thing? Uh, so, and I don't know what the best way to get there. I do think having a separate meeting to go through this thing is probably, so we can get it into the public domain. We can talk about it. We get plenty of time to listen to what the residents say. We can express our, our thoughts on this thing. So my suggestion would be let's schedule, and we have to do it tonight, but let's schedule a separate meeting, deal with short-term rentals, listen to what Bruce has to say in terms of his research, and come up with a plan that says, and I hope it would be something similar to what Paul said, but let's go back to Coastal and say, guys, you got a choice. Give us what, you know, we told you what we want to do. If you don't want to do that, we'll go back to your original plan, and let's see where that takes us. I, I got no problem with that at all. Thank you, Steve. Bruce? Well, given what you just said, Paul, I, I'm going to make a motion, which is what I had planned to do after making the presentation I was going to make, and we might actually be together on this, and I, we might get a third, although maybe I'll be wrong in what, what I heard you say. Here's what I had planned to propose, and I'm going to propose it now. We decline the Coastal Commission's staff's invitation to further weaken the ordinance. We explain to the staff that the hosted ordinance actually increases the availability of short-term rentals in Malibu and does not narrow that availability because the way our law actually does work. We further explain that we'll be forced to begin the strict enforcement of our existing zoning law to prohibit short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods if the Coastal Commission does not approve the legislation that we have proposed, which actually, for the first time in Malibu's history, grants that authority in a limited way. That's, that's, that's my proposal. Uh, and I could provide that language um, to, the, to the clerk to put into the motion if necessary. That's the guidance I would. Okay. And the, what I'll say also is, Mikey, I, I, I think you do know less today. You don't know less today than you knew before. I think you realize you know less than you thought you knew. There's a difference. I don't think you ever really knew because you were never really informed. And, and, and that's, not, that's not on you. It was, on the, it was on the city to inform you. You were never informed. But if we don't get this, if they say no to this, we go to court. It's called a declaratory judgment. It's, there's no fines potentially available because you don't have a law until you get a decision from the court. And you go ask the California Supreme Court to rule on this once and for all, and you get other coastal cities that are in the same bind we're in to join with us. And we get a decision once and for all. Maybe we won't like the decision we get, but we have a chance of getting a better decision from the Supreme Court than we do from the Coastal Commission because there's a housing shortage in California, and that's an issue the Coastal Commission could care less about, but the California Supreme Court does care about. And there's not affordable places to stay. So um, we do need more education. We do need the assistance, perhaps, ultimately, of the courts. But again, so to repeat the language, decline the Coastal Commission's invitation to further weaken the ordinance, explain that the hosted ordinance actually increases the availability of short-term rentals in Malibu as a legal matter and does not, narrow that, does not narrow that availability, and further explain that we'll be forced to begin strict enforcement of our existing law and prohibit short-term rentals altogether in residential neighborhoods if the Coastal Commission 
doesn't approve our enabling legislation, which actually for the first time grants the right to have short-term rentals in Malibu. Karen. I see uh, Trevor, hand. thank you. Trevor is our city attorney. Can you comment on that, please? Sure. So um, if, if we go down this route, uh, we'll wait and see what the Coastal Commission does. They may listen to their staff, they may not. And once they render their decision, it'll come back to the city and we'll have a choice at that point in time. We can take a writ to challenge the decision. Uh, we could have um, a number of arguments that have been talked about here about it. Um, the current state of the Court of Appeals is that these types of arguments have been um, not accepted by the court. The most recent one is in dealing with Manhattan Beach, the Keene decision. In that case, they determined since long-term rentals were allowed of properties, short-term rentals were allowed of properties, and also that an argument that it was a hotel was discarded as well. And so um, the, the court in that case ruled against the city of Manhattan Beach. They had also gone through a process similar to what we would be in in that case where they had put forward um, an LCP amendment, but then they did not put it forward to the Coastal Commission when they heard back from staff that that was not um, going to be well received by the Coastal Commission, and then they moved forward. Similarly, in the Cracky case of um, Santa Barbara, they had a situation where they made an argument they had never allowed short-term rentals in the city, and they put forward an enforcement um, ordinance that uh, provided more funding to go after short-term rentals and the court there made it uh, determined against the city of, of Santa Barbara that um, they were actually changing the allowed uses in the city and it needed a, an LCP amendment or a CDP and there's flaws in, in some of these decisions um, you know so I just want to be clear that, that the city if, if it's going to challenge this will be fa facing a headwind on that but there are arguments that we can make um, if we do choose to go that route. Can I add something? Sure. I, I, you know, I, I didn't go through the, 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 count, the countervailing case law, which is from the highest courts of multiple states, but there are distinctions between our situation and the Manhattan Beach situation and the um, Santa Barbara situation. And as I said, the, the California Supreme Court is silent, oh, totally silent on this issue up till now. But the, I, I read what happened with the, I read the briefs, I read the decision from uh, Manhattan Beach, which is definitely the most difficult decision for us to have to deal with. But they did not make the arguments that they needed. They didn't make all the right arguments that they should have made. And that often leads to a loss. So there's, there's, there's more to it than just that there's these court of appeals decisions that run contrary. Another court of appeals might decide differently. And again, ultimately the California Supreme Court clearly might decide differently. It's gonna open, Open season at that point. Open slate. No one knows what they'll rule. 50-50 almost. Yeah, I've, I've been involved in a couple of amicus cases that have been trying to create a conflict with the Cracky case to get it attention with the Supreme Court. That hasn't happened at this point. We got a favorable decision, but it didn't um, create the conflict and address some of those issues. I see your hand. Yeah. Uh, I want to understand the motion. The most because the motion um, I'm interested in is just to send it back to Coastal, see what they decide, and then we can make an informed decision. Um, but I, Bruce's version was, I didn't quite get all of it, but sound like that was Paul's version. I'm not sure if they're the same version or they're different. So I'm a little lost there. I, I, I think the difference, the, the only, it, we, it is sending it back and telling them we want the Coastal Commission to decide, but it's also informing them that it is, it is our view that if they turn us down on this, it goes back to our coastal plan, which many people in Malibu believes forbids short-term rentals. And that was something that wasn't drafted by Malibu. It was drafted by the Coastal Commission and inflicted on us. And maybe they'll consider that, or maybe they won't. But we'll certainly know more about what the actual commissioners think. I, I'm uh, I'm a little irritated that it's it's the the staff is in a position right now where uh, the people who run the Coastal Commission, the actual Jack Ainsworth, for example, is 
is very interested in the fact that communities up and down the state are pushing back against the Coastal Commission on, uh, on the sea level rise managed retreat uh, requirements and on the, the push they've had to make 1977, anything built after 1970, anything built after 1977 subject to having pretending that they agreed at that time that they would tear down their house once the water touched it. There, there is, there is uh, I don't know if it's a lack of confidence in the, direct, in the direction staff has been taking them, but staff is, is not at the Coastal Commission, is not in total control. So that's, that's my argument in favor of, of what we're talking about. And I think that we ought to find out what's going on. And if you want to have another meeting about this as well, so. Well, I don't think we don't we don't need to have another meeting if we if we pass this motion to give staff direction to just tell them to pound sand and explain to them why they're wrong. That's well, correct. The, the, the coastal commission has given staff is asked staff if uh, the you know, coastal has indicated that they are likely to decline this either completely or otherwise conclude suggested modifications and offer to um, allow the city to provide input about what those suggested modifications would be in terms of there's many different ways to allow um, unhosted in different ways either through permits through zoning through different ways and if there was a preference for the city they wanted to hear that we will not be providing that type of feedback to them and be just be putting forward the, the hosted ordinance um, and then uh, sharing the the other feedback in the motion Okay. But Trevor, did you just say the coastal is going to deny it or the coastal staff is going to recommend denial? The coastal staff is um, leaning towards recommending denial. That's okay. where we're at. Yes. Because no, no one There's can know. There's no what contact it, with the commissioners. This is only with staff. Right. Okay. Because nobody can know what coastal is going to do because the Brown Act precludes them from having made a decision yet, right? If they did, then we would be having a different conversation. Okay. Okay. We got a motion and a second. I'd like to call a question. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Green? Yes. Motion carries. Well, that was easy. Uh, uh, Mayor, let's get one more. Mayor, point, point of order. It says here in page nine of my agenda, no new items will be taken up after 1030 without a two thirds vote of the city council. Well, I would like that we have a two thirds vote in favor of taking up item 6B. Can we take a motion, a vote on that, Kelsey? And I'm, I'm perfectly willing to stop after we've done 6B. That's a motion from Mayor Grisanti. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. Mayor Grisanti? Wait, do we have any speakers on 6B? Well, this is a motion to hear the item. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yeah. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? I'm voting yes to hear 6B, but not to only hear 6B. That would still be a yes for this motion then, and the council can address the others later. Okay. That motion carries. Okay. 6B is an employment agreement for city manager's services between the city of Malibu and Stephen L. McClary. May we have a staff report? Mayor Grisanti, members of the council, good evening, almost good morning. Um, the council did appoint Mr. McClary as its next city manager on April 27th, subject to the approval of an employment agreement. Since April 27th, Mr. McClure and I have had uh, several conversations about the employment agreement, and it has been presented to you on closed session in terms of its terms. Um, it is before you tonight for public approval, uh, public review and public approval. The agreement has several components. The first is a starting annual base salary of $235,000. Uh, the base salary will be reviewed annually by the council, which can increase that salary in its sole discretion. It contains a $400 $400 auto allowance, health benefits, leave accruals, and retirement benefits consistent with the other management employees, a 6% contribution to Mr. McClary's deferred compensation account, 
reimbursement of up to $25,000 in relocation costs should Mr. McClary move to within 12 miles or 30 minute drive of City Hall and termination at the council's sole discretion upon the payment of six months salary, i.e. severance. Uh, the agreement does provide that Mr. McClary could terminate the agreement on 45 days notice. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about the agreement. Again, it's before you tonight uh, for your approval. I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have any public comments? No, you don't have any speakers for this item. Oh, I'm sorry, there is just a raised hand there. You have one speaker for this item. It's Joe Drummond. Joe, can we, are you available? Hi, I just, I was just listening to that and I just remembered that um, I sent in an email a while ago that said for the severance, just because it's so new, do we have to do six months right away? That's all, that's all I'm saying. Like, should it be scaled back every year, like two months and then three months and then four months every year? That's all, thanks. Thank you. Bruce. I have a quick comment. And first, I'll make a motion to approve the contract. Um, just for discussion purposes, I'll note, I, I had wanted, I, I spoke to John about this and I thought there was gonna be a provision in there that said that we would both in good faith try to find a way to bring Steve to Malibu. Um, and, and that if we could find a way to make it financially attractive, he would in good faith agree to, to take advantage of it. Um, that didn't show up in it after I thought it was going to, and it's not gonna stand in the way of my voting to approve it. But I, I guess I would love to hear from Steve that if we can find a way to make it financially attractive for him to move to Malibu, um, he'd do so because it, I, I think we've been at a disservice from not having city managers who live here. Um, it's, it's a lot of what we've been talking about all night. That there's a difference between making intellectual decisions and making decisions that people who live here understand and want. So with that, that said, I, I move to approve the contract. And I second the motion to approve the contract. And I can tell you what I've talked to John Cotty about, and there's nothing that keeps us at any time if an opportunity shows up to keep us from showing it to Mr. McClary and, and making an offer to make it affordable. So that's something that right now, I don't think that there's anything that's there, but we, know, we don't know what's gonna happen three months from now, so. I, I would I would urge us all to go ahead and vote for this and and have Steve and the rest of the community know that should he uh, decide to move to Malibu, we're gonna do everything we can to make it affordable for you. And we'd like to have you here. Uh, can I say one other thing, which is, because I always, I think the residents deserve to be responded to. Uh, it's not realistic to shorten the, um, the severance time, especially since we're gonna have an election in a couple months. And although I, I, I believe that the new city council, if there's a different city council, will still be happy with Steve and want him to be our city manager, he can't be guaranteed that. So I, I, it, it's absolutely appropriate and necessary to give him the severance that we've set forth in the draft agreement. I agree with you. We have a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? I think you fainted. <laughs> Can we circle back to Mikey? In a moment, Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilor Pearson, are you available? <laughs> he wasn't Can feeling well. Maybe he's. Yeah, we may have lost Mike. Can someone text him? Oh, we're not allowed to do that. Not one of us. Yeah. Does it matter? We have four zero. 
Yeah. With Councilmember Pearson absent at this moment, the motion does carry 4-0. Very good. So, Paul, on the, the remaining three items, I, I don't want to be here till one o'clock any more than anyone else does. Neither but, do I. Um, the, the Steve's, well, yours is a letter, which I think maybe we can knock out real quick. Steve's proposal, I would have no problem putting it off so long as nothing's going to happen yeah. before it gets decided again. And the school one, there's good, I'm glad there's going to be a meeting tomorrow. Maybe they can talk about that as well. And, 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 but, you know, time is, time is critical because we're in summer recess. There's, it's a short recess. And if we're going to have, get anything done before the school year starts again, it really needs to be done sooner than later. So those are my thoughts as to why it's important to do these things. But at a minimum, we should get your letter approved. I wouldn't think that's going to take more than a couple minutes. And I would like assurance that nothing's going to happen with the library funds until there's an opportunity to decide whether something should anew. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein, we did have a conversation with the library uh, library district, and I'm told that it will not be presented to the board until the city makes a decision. Is Ms. Shavelson on? I think she can confirm that. I hope she's still on. She's... Well, I knew that was based on us meeting tonight and talking about it. So if, yeah. as long as that's still in place. It's my understanding is that it is still in place. I haven't heard otherwise. If we learn something tomorrow, we will immediately get the council together and, and revisit the issue because I know that's important. Okay. Cool. All right. And Karen, will you, you, I can't attend the meeting tomorrow. Will you discuss whether it makes sense to recommend that the city hire a consultant for school safety issues? We will be having presentations from Captain C2, and this group will receive that information and perhaps make a recommendation. I don't know how much you want to talk about this since we're not on the item. Um, yeah, I'll be happy to report back on what happens at the meeting. Let me suggest one additional thing. I, and this came up someplace in a conversation with Steve Massetti or somebody. That, there was a, a comment that said that the people designing the school had hired some kind of a consultant in terms of the design of the school to deal with safety. I don't know if you guys have got that on your radar screen that you may want to ask and see if that actually was done. There may be some help you can get from them uh, as they go through this new school design. Just for what it's worth. I assume that's standard procedure. I have no idea. I'm just. And I, I heard uh, the planning commission's talk and they, they talked about moving at that point to moving all the access points to the front. Right. Not having any access points along the back at all. So, so, so I'll, I'll move that. Can I move that we at least pass the letter and let uh, Paul, is there, is there a time sensitivity to the letter? There's always a time sensitivity to a letter. And this one is a relatively, uh, there's, there's two bills. They both are to the end. Well, wait, work. so, so I, I'm going to move that we at least hear that one and that we pass the other two to the next meeting. I'll okay. second that. Okay, we're on it. So. We need to vote. Um, yes. So this is a motion to take up item 7A tonight and continue item 7D and 7C to the next meeting. Thank Correct. you so much. I, I have a question since the, the community meeting is tomorrow. I, I'm not sure how necessary item 7C is. That's why I'm- It's already agreeing. being dealt with. That's why I'm agreeing it could be passed. It may or may not be necessary after you have your meeting. Okay, if you wanna do it that way, fine. Okay, no, it's good. All right, so, so we have a motion to move this item 7A? Move item 7A and- and your item 7A. So you'll, okay. you'll hear item 7A, you'll have your report, you'll listen to any comments you might have. Um, so that's the current motion to hear 7A and continue 7B and C to the next meeting. Okay. okay. Can we have a vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Uri? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. So 
Basically, there's two emergency preparedness bills that are moving forward, and it is valuable to the city of Malibu to join in support of it and ask and provide a letter of support. And so, and this is in interaction with Cal Strategies. This is what they have recommended, and I believe it's the correct thing to do. The state fire marshal person that would be there would actually have the power to determine where there are going to be fuel reductions in California. And for the last 20 some years, we've had no fuel reduction in any of the mountains around us because Sheila and her friends didn't want it. So, it would be nice to have someone who is not worried about getting reelected in two years to decide those things or advocate for those two things. And that's what we get out of AB 2377. The other law is AB 2477, and that is requiring people who purport to provide warning systems to communities have to have, the systems have to actually be tested and work, which is not a high, you know, basically we won't, we would not buy vaporware. So, those are what those two things are about, and I'm glad to answer any questions. And, of course, I'm also willing to listen to public comment if public wants to, do we have any members of the public on 7A? No, I don't have any speaker sign-ups or any raised hands for this item. Okay. I'll make a motion to move 7A. Second. We have a motion and a second to move 7A. Will you take the roll, please? Council Member Urey? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Motion adjourned. It's been too much fun, guys. It has been too much fun by about an hour and a half of too much fun. You got it. All right, guys, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Mr. Mayor. We need to formally adjourn. Motion to adjourn, Paul. You can do it by yourself. Yeah, you can. Yes. On behalf of me, I decided to adjourn. Done. Adios, guys. Thank you very much. See ya. Thank you very much, Mr. McClary. Yeah, Steve, congratulations. That's good. Thank you all. Thanks for your support.